What is up? Welcome to the docket presented by Defense Diaries. I'm your host, Bob Mata. Uh, we're back. Look at that. Comfort of my own home. Much better than being on the road in the hotel. Uh, I was very whiny and cryy and hungry and complainy last night. I should be significantly better tonight. I did get a good night's rest and I did ultimately put some food in my belly. Even though I didn't really get the opportunity to eat like I would have liked to, um, you know, because I did court TV, which surprisingly, they didn't have me covering Delphi. They had me covering Soto, which is a devastatingly sad case in its own right. But, um, you know, Vinny has me on quite a bit. I, I just thought that they were going to have me on for Delphi. So I was a little surprised by that. And then, you know, I, I agreed to do News Nation at, um, like 10 30 or something like that so and then i went to bed so yeah sorry you guys about last night about my um my overall crabbiness I, I think i got a little better as it went on but coming into it i was not <laughs> like i did it for you guys there was no part of me at all honestly that felt like going live last night it was a super long ass day and i wasn't feeling it like, I would, you know, so whatever. But I did it because I love you guys. Um, and I made a horrible fucking mistake saying, like, the girl. So I, I corrected it on Twitter. And that's what I get for not reading my notes. Uh, in Click's testimony, where he's talking about the the phone and the, the intel that they had on the phone. Uh, I can't remember if I said it was a video. In, in court, they didn't really specify. Um, I think they called it information on the phone or there was some kind of recording, they called it. Uh, and it was, and they didn't use, Click didn't use a gender. He said an individual. Um, and I think last night I said, girl, I started seeing it. And then Kara had, uh, and I think through um, Hoosier Cold case had dug up the actual warrant, which is was interesting because when we get to that, and, I, and I, I'm going to tell you right now, I have very little interest in the leak shit, the contempt thing. Like I, I'm just... I'm being honest with you. Teresa just did a great episode on it. Um, I'm going to cover it. I'm going to whip through it. It's not interesting to me. It has no legal significance. I don't care what you're hearing on other channels. I, I don't care who it is, whether they're prosecutors. <laughs> it has no legal significance. All I care about is things at this point, 56 days out of trial, which are going to impact the trial. And one thing, I'll give you the spoiler and I said it last night, and I'm going to re-say it because it bears repeating. Um, in terms of her giving Hennessy a week to do a written memo as to that contempt hearing, and then giving McClellan the same amount of time, which brings us to April 1st, and then giving herself 30 days to rule, tells you that she's not going to do anything that's going to affect the trial. She's certainly not going to be kicking them off, which she can't. Like by the law, for a, a, a contempt motion, like removing counsel is not an option for you. Uh, does that mean that she would have followed the law? No, but we know she's not doing that, even though she couldn't have. But she would have if she wanted to. Um, that's not happening. Not going to jail. I think at the end of the day, this is probably going to be a fine for those guys, um, which is ironic because she's not paying Rosie and she's not paying any of their investigators and she's at this point hasn't agreed to pay for them to hire any experts. So it's ironic that she'll find them. Um, so, and, and I was, uh, you know, like this, this thing with, uh, and I have to be honest, it, it's it like, this thing drives me nuts. The like, I didn't even want to hear it. I went against my will yesterday. I, I wanted to, I really only wanted to hear the motion to dismiss. It was the whole reason I went. If it was just for this, this motion to contempt or motion for contempt thing, I, I probably wouldn't have gone, to be honest with you. I say that, but I'm probably full of shit. I probably still would have gone. But I, I, I just don't have any interest in it. It's not interesting to me. It's just not. I, I don't care who leaked it. I don't care what YouTubers got the, the photos. It doesn't mean anything to me. You know, and, and short of them being able, them being the state being able to prove that, that Baldwin intentionally distributed these to Westerman in order for him to put them out, which they didn't do and couldn't do because Baldwin didn't do that. Or if Hennessy could have dug up that this someone this was orchestrated by the state somehow or somebody acting on behalf of the state. 
which he couldn't do. Like those were the only two things, like those possibilities, which I realized in very short order, like as soon as it started with McClellan, that he didn't have anything for real. Um, you know, so like it, it just wasn't interesting. What was interesting, which was which, which is getting no play, which should speak volumes to you. It's not really getting play. And a lot of people have said, why, why have they like, why is the the the, the motion to dismiss and, and click testifying been blacked out, like in terms of the media? And a lot of that goes to the fact the way that Gull decided to conduct this hearing in the shadows without cameras in there. Yesterday should have a hundred percent been filmed. It should have been streamed. There's like, I'm adamant about that, that hundred percent should have been completely and totally streamed. We all deserve to watch that. You guys all deserve to watch it. It's like funny. I, I was driving back today. I got up and like, I slept in till like nine. It was glorious which was actually 10 there, but on my body clock, it was nine. And, you know, I, I picked up my phone and Kara had posted the thing. And then people are like, wait, Bob was saying it was a girl. <laughs> I'm like, oh God. So I had to, of course, go on and correct that because the one thing that matters to me most is giving you all correct information. If I screw something up, I'm going to own it immediately and I'm going to correct it immediately, especially something like that, because I don't want what Todd Click was saying in court to be overshadowed by anything. I, I don't want people, you know, I don't want my miss, my misstatement overshadowing what the significance of that was. And the significance of that to me had nothing to do with the motion to dismiss. I'll give you another spoiler alert. She's going to, of course, deny that. She's definitely not dismissing the case. Um, you know, wh whether or not, even if, even if, they could have shown that the state purposefully destructed, you know, destroyed the evidence, which they couldn't. Um, I, I don't like she's not dismissing it because of the summary reports, wherein they can get the same information theoretically. Now, I was sitting there during the hearing, like in Gambese was sitting right next to me, and I had actually I'd actually meant to mentioned Gambies or I wanted to hit her up today and I wanted her to send me her notes so we I could compare um you know but it, it was a long day driving today and I didn't like I would have preferred to if I had known that Sleuthy was taking people's notes and transcribing them I would have taken like the whatever the 80 screenshots of my little notebook here and sent them all she probably would have like been able to maybe to read every other word my handwriting's horrible, but um, that would have made my life so much easier. So, because I, I kind of typed some out, I didn't have as much time as I would have liked to transcribe them. Um, so, kind of like like I'm just forewarning you, if if you're coming into this live, hopefully that I'm going to be deep diving into a motion that I feel has zero significance to the trial. Again, and, and I'm going to restate this one more time. I think the leak sucked. I think it was awful. I think that Westerman or whoever else did this is an awful person. <laughs> Anybody like whoever feels the need to go get crime scene photos of two young girls that have been killed and start distributing them as issues like that. That's a different thing. Like there's two there's two things we're dealing with. We're dealing with that fact alone, which I think we all agree on in terms of it being. Oh, what's up? I was going to listen to you. Oh, you were? I, I didn't. I was going to. Allie just walked on. She was sleeping. I, I couldn't. I didn't have the heart to wake her up for this. Um, so, but, you know, so we have that issue, which I think we all agree on. I, I think that we all agree on the fact that, that the, the taking of the photos in and of itself is just as low rent as you can get as a human being. The other, the other side of this is the fact that it didn't affect Rick Allen's right to a speedy trial. It did when she removed them, her, his attorneys, that affected his ability to get a speedy and fair trial. The leak didn't. But in a roundabout way, when she had removed him before the Supreme Court corrected the issue, 
that certainly affected his ability to get a fair trial. But, I, you know, I think that that ship got righted. And, you know, I, I was listening on uh, the prosecutors live last night, and I just could not disagree with Alice Moore. You know, she's got the, the leaks as like the most horrific thing that's ever happened and that it's going to affect Rick Allen's trial. And I, I just I disagree with her. I, I think that the thing was contained. I think the fact that it's still being talked about and that McClellan's having hearings about it, like when it should have been dead in the water. You know, I, I don't know. That's just my thoughts on it. You know, like I, I'm just I, I, I'm over it. I'm like so over. It. I don't care about it. I don't care about who got him. I don't care about who sent them. I don't care about the circles and the rectangles. I just don't. Like, none of that makes any difference to me. We are 56 days away from trial, people. The only thing that we should give a shit about are things that are going to affect trial. So that being said, I'm against my will going to go through my notes regarding this contempt hearing. I'm not going through the objections and all that stuff. Like I said, if you guys want a great stream on it, my girl, Teresa, she took care of you. She, I, I don't know how long she was on. I jumped on for about 40 minutes when I was making tacos because I love listening to her. She's got a great voice. She's super smart. She's one of my people. Um, and she, she really, she had a lot. She gave a really thorough, um, you know, kind of breakdown. And, and I don't know whose notes. It sounds like it was collaborative. Um, and she had it up and she was going through it. So, uh, okay, enough of, enough of that. So I just want to make sure. Last night, if you're coming in late, when I when I mentioned that Click was talking, when he was talking about what was on Johnny Messer's phone, I misstated that it was a girl or a woman. It, in court, he said an individual, and then somebody, I think it was Hoosier Cold Case, dug up that warrant that it looks like Click prepared because Unified Command didn't do anything about it. And it, it was a guy. It was a guy that was held at gunpoint. It appears that it was a part of a, uh, a drug deal gone bad. So um, to me, none of that matters in terms of what was really like. And, and somebody was messaging me today saying, oh, you made it seem like unified command or that the law enforcement didn't do anything about that. And I was trying to explain um, to her. And she's like, I don't think you're understanding me. I was saying, you don't understand. <laughs> you're not understanding me. And so we didn't understand each other. It, what, what was clear is that at the point in time that click went to, well, I, I'll talk about that when I get there. <clears throat> All right. Cause people are always like, Oh, you're always jumping around. So I'm going to, I'm going to go in order. All right. So we get there in the morning. I told you yesterday, uh, the day started off with Gully yelling at us in the gallery to shut up. <laughs> shut up. Be quiet. Sit down. And it was, she was angry. I mean, like she came out like on fire, but like that kind of move by a judge right away keeps the court under control. You know, it was like, it was a big flex by her. Um, so the first thing she handled, and she handled a, a bunch of motions, uh, which I, when I kind of predicted before she had fi uh, like actually filed an order on what was going to be the afternoon thing, and I had predicted everybody would be that motion dismissed, then I don't know when she actually made the order confirming it, but because um, I knew that the motion to amend the charges, that's that's a like a 30 second, um, it's really like a 30 second motion. <laughs> you know, the defense isn't going to object to it. Uh, so uh, they added the two murder charges. Um, without objection by the defense and without objection, they, uh, the state dismissed, uh, counts five and six, which were the kidnapping charges, which were of no consequence because they had added three and four, which one of the elements of that is that as part of a kidnapping, a murder occurred. So they were duplicative. It's still in the same position. It didn't change anything with respect to what has to be proved. Um, so that was that. And then Hennessy had filed multiple motions and um, he basically was asking for a continuance. Um, the basis for that was that it, well, first she denied everything that he had filed ahead of time, like into the days preceding the 18th. So those all got aced 
like his motion. He had filed for a motion for a continuance. Um, she denied that, obviously, and he had filed a verified motion for the continuance. That got denied also. And then um, the motion to continue the ancillary hearing was denied. And he also had filed that motion for a change of venue. This I like to hear, um, kind of, because I, I have to tell you that Alcorny, the Allen County Courthouse is beautiful. And it's much, much bigger than um, Carroll County. So I kind of liked it. I kind of didn't. <laughs> But he had filed a motion for a change of venue relating to that, to the hearing yesterday. She said, you know, and he was saying per statute, you had to do it by, by rule, by Indiana court rule. And she didn't necessarily disagree with him, but she's like, you know, you, this thing has been out there. You know, you knew this was coming. You didn't file it in a timely fashion. You filed it too late. So obviously we're here. Obviously we're doing it here. Uh, but she did say, that all future hearings will be held in Carroll County. So um, I guess that was my last time aside from, and, and she did mention that the jury, which I was discussing with people outside when I was waiting online to get in, uh, the jury will be selected in Carroll, uh, I'm sorry, in Allen County. So the lawyers will go up there, they'll pick the jury um, from all the, the Allen County residents that got jury notices. And by the way, those went out March 14th, the questionnaires and the notice. So this thing's going. Like if anybody is of the mindset that it's not going to go, um, all signs point to yes. That's that's definitely the way it looks. When, when those things go out, any lawyer is going to be really hard pressed to come in and ask for a continuance because the, the, you know, the wheels are in motion. So when I found that out, you know, cause there's a lot of people that are still thinking this is a move by the defense and, you know, they're going to come in asking for a continuance on the eve of trial. I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, I think it's going to go. So um, then we had, uh, she took, a small amount of argument on Hennessy's motion to DQ McClelland. The main thrust of his motion was that McClelland was going to have to testify at this hearing. And McClelland's counter was like, and, and before we get to that, Hennessy had said, look, he's got two other, uh, he's got two other attorneys here. And I had also misstated that the female attorney, I think her last name is Diener, was an AG uh, from the AG's office. She was not. So that was incorrect also. Um, oddly enough, it sounds like uh, it sounds like she was Keegan Klein's prosecutor. <laughs> that's just, I, I, I can't say that uh, that that's true because I haven't seen documentation from my like from, but Kara uh, Winicky said that it's true. so I'm I'm always extremely comfortable with anything that anything that Kara puts out I take is is gospel so I'm going to assume that it's true um because she she's not she's not coming with bullshit she comes with receipts she she knows what she's doing she knows what she's talking about so so that's interesting um all right so Hennessy makes the argument that he's gonna have to testify that he doesn't need to try it because of the other uh, prosecutors there. McClellan's response was, well, they haven't been working on this at all. They don't know anything about it. I would hope not. I would hope not. That was the thing that I was talking about prior. No one in that office should have been working on this motion because it's stupid. It's a, It was a pointless motion. It really was. And it's like, I know the people out there that want like the attorneys to get punished for the leak. It's It, it just doesn't matter at this point. It really does. Like, if, if you care about the trial, if you care, if you really care about justice for Abby and Libby, and you care about this trial being done in a proper fashion by everybody involved, you shouldn't have cared about that motion yesterday because it was stupid. Really, I, I don't know what other word do you like stupid, superfluous, uh, meaningless, like any adjective that I can think of to describe that as having zero value. I'm applying it to it because that's what it was, in my opinion. But in terms of the legal side of it, I'm right. 
it had it had no value. It did nothing to move the needle forward in terms of the trial itself. Um, so ultimately, uh, you know, she ends up denying his motion because, you know, McClellan's like, I don't need to testify. You know, it's like, but why do I need to testify? <laughs> you know, it's like I, I didn't leak anything, I, you know, allegedly. So like, why do I have to get up there and testify? So she agreed and denied that motion. Um, and then so at that point, um, you know, they start talking about some of the evidence uh, that's going to be introduced. Um, and, it, and there was more to that argument, but I'm not going to spend a bunch of time. You know, they were talking about like the, the whole Fig Solves thing came up, communications between McClellan and Fig Solves. That's why Hennessy was saying he had to, he'd have to testify because uh, that Gary Bodette guy wasn't in court. So he was saying, you know, I, I'm going to need Nick to testify about this stuff, you know, about like the stuff we saw, like the, the emails between McClelland and Bodette, you know. And then um, let me see. Uh, let's see. Blah, blah. How did he speak with the Westman? Okay. So, yeah. Th so that thing's all, like it's, it, it really wasn't interesting. <laughs> and I knew that was going to get denied. So that gets denied. Um, and then interestingly, um, Hennessy had brought up something that, uh, Michael Osbrook had filed and had supplied him with, um, and it was kind of like Hennessy took a lot of shots at trying to get rid of this thing before it happened, all of which were unsuccessful, but he, he took a lot of shots the the continuances to try to get this thing continued. You know, he was all, he also said he wasn't prepared for it because he got late discovery. Um, all of those things were denied. And, you know, so he's, you know, and, and he kind of laid back into what Michael Osbrook's arguments were, which were by the law, absolutely correct. The thing should have never moved forward yesterday anyway, like based on the law, like we, we still never really found out whether it was criminal or whether or not it was. Uh, a civil contempt hearing, like like the judge never delineated in so many words. Hennessy, um, you know, he basically, he just assumed that it was criminal um, because McClellan had mentioned jail in his pleading. So um, ultimately, you know, he cites some case law, he cites some bench notes, and he's talking about um, you know, that in order uh, that the burden for McClelland in a criminal contempt hearing is beyond a reasonable doubt, which is, the, as you guys know, as true crime fans, is the highest burden that you can get in criminal law. So, uh, and he cited the case where that came from. Um, of course, uh, all of those all those additional attempts at getting this thing kicked were, were also denied. Um, and ultimately at that point, uh, and it was funny because Hennessy stood up and he's like, I'd like to make an opening statement. And so he did. And, and he, you know, he goes into well, what is, you know, what is contemptuous conduct? And, you know, he goes into what I've been saying that it's gotta be willful. Like it has to be something that that somebody is purposefully, like in this case, it like in no it like is purposefully just not following a court order, and you know so they first you know he says the press release, you know that that clearly happened before there was a court order so that can't apply, you know the the misdirected email that that clearly was not on purpose. You know, and, and he basically demonstrated that by saying, look, like if you read the body of the email, it's it's addressed to Brad. Hey, dear Brad, you know, not to Brandon, you know. So and then we have the leak, the leak itself. So those are the three things. And one thing that kind of fell off the table from the state side of it was um, the hearing with respect to uh, the safekeeping that was in June where you know they were they were saying that 
you know, they weren't truthful um, about the allegations and their pleadings. That never kind of made it to the table in this hearing. Thankfully, if that had happened, that that, that hearing would have taken all day. And I would have just, I, I wouldn't have, like, I, I would have been beside myself. I would have been like, oh, my God. And drove, I woke up at 2 in the morning for this. Um, so essentially, you know, Hennessy makes his argument that, look, none of the stuff was willful. Like, he can't meet his burden. We shouldn't even be having this. None, it was, none of it was willful. Um, and then McClellan gave a brief opening. And uh, ultimately, you know, he, he makes his argument. He cites this Rule 201. And, and then, interestingly, he he uh, transposes the dates. So he, like he says in his opening that, um, that the, the gag order came out on December 1st and that the press release came out on December 2nd. And I was sitting there, I'm like, no, it didn't. I mean, like, that was the whole thing. Like, that's, you know, and, and McClellan was adamant about it until um, Hennessy stood up and he's like, I want you, your honor to take judicial notice that the gag came out on uh, December 2nd um, after the press release came out on December 1st. And then, you know, much like I misspoke uh, about Click's testimony, uh, McClellan admitted that he misspoke about that and that the, the press release came out before the gag order. Um, so, the, so then we get to, the, we finally get to the hearing. We're probably about 45 minutes in and the hearing starts. And uh, so McClellan's motion, so it's his case. So he's got, he's got to, he's got to put it up. Wait, Frank who? Frank, little Frank? Not a chance, dude. That guy, whatever, whatever chance that guy ever had of talking to me, he blew last week. So if it's, if it's big Frank, I, I debate big Frank. I like big Frank, actually. I mean, we have very different opinions on this case, but he's always at, He's always at the hearings and he's a he's a nice guy you know i mean we just think about this thing differently that's all but if it's little frank uh, not happening never uh yeah i mean like i still haven't blocked that guy but i should like i just don't block people you know like i, I don't care if people don't like me that's that's their problem you know it's like i like i don't so like the only thing that bothers me is when people pick on me and <laughs> i start whining i do whine when you guys pick on me it makes me feel all bad so much work into this people just sitting there nitpicking on me um so i'm gonna try to get better at that too like i was uh kind of reading through the comments last night and there was like one little like one little section where somebody said i was picking on alley and i'm like my god like this person's clearly never watched my shit you know anybody watches knows that i, I love allison more than anything in the whole world i adore her she's my hero my champion. She's all of the things, all the good things. Um, all right. So they, they, uh, McClellan calls Steve Mullen, who was, uh, an investigator for Carroll County. Um, and he comes on and testifies and you know, like he, so he kind of goes through the things and, and what I'm not going to do, uh, is go through the, the objections, you know, like I, I know Teresa was asking about how things that they clearly appeared to be hearsay um, were allowed in by Gull. And, you know, I, I know she wants to know, and I'm just not going to give her the answer. <laughs> I just like this hearing, man, was uh, just it was a colossal waste of time. Like, you know, who was interesting to was YouTubers. That's who it was interesting to. And remember, I'm a podcaster who happens to do YouTube. Um, so uh, it just wasn't interesting to me. I didn't think it was interesting. Like, I, I didn't care about it when it was going on. And I'm talking about the leak. I didn't care about, you know, figuring out who got them and who sent them to who. Like, uh, like none of that interested me at all. But, you know, I'm a law guy. I care about the law. I care about the Constitution. That was the stuff that I cared about. You know, and and it, that stands. That's still what I care about. All the other things like this, I don't care about. But because you guys want some, uh, I'm going to give it to you. So uh, in March of 2023, um, Mullen testified that he had a call uh, regarding Brandon Woodhouse's YouTube video, which had popped up on 
what else? YouTube. And, um, and this had this index, this itemized list of the exhibits. And, um, you know, so he says, oh, look. Uh, and, and so, like, kind of see, like, it was weird. They were trying to, like, Mullen didn't really understand on cross. Like, kind of see it asked him. He's like, you know, he's like, so it was a, it was like something that you create when you send it over to the, to the prosecutor. Like, you'll say, okay, this is all the stuff I'm sending. He's like, what do you mean? He's like, it's a, an index. It's like, a, just telling you what's in there. You know, and he's like, he's like, uh, yeah, I think, I think, yeah. I'm like, that's exactly what it was. It was like the defense, like when we get our discovery and we do the same thing, we make an index. So it's not complete chaos. You know, you got to try to organize your stuff so you can see what you got and what you don't have. You know, you number it, you start saying, okay, let's start going through these, check it off, make sure we have them, which is ultimately how they find out that the videos that they get to that was the subject matter of the second motion, motion to dismiss. Um, and, and I want to spend a bulk of my time on that. Like I'm not doing a three hour live tonight. Like there's no way. Um, and, and I don't care about this one. So I want to spend a bulk of my time on the motion that everybody's ignoring, which I refuse to ignore. Um, so I hope you guys aren't going to be disappointed with that. I, I just, I know I keep saying it, but I don't care about this motion. You guys understand that? I mean, I imagine at this point you understand I don't care about this motion. Um, so at any rate, uh, Mullen testifies that, he, that the defense came and picked up the audio from Professor Turco on uh, 927 of 2023. Um, and, you know, Mullen also establishes that he didn't create that index, that that was something that was created by the defense in order to show that it came from the defense, which we all knew. But, you know, like theoretically, the judge doesn't know. So they had to get it into evidence that uh, Baldwin had sent that, that email, you know. Um, so then he goes into the Turco interview. Um, the Again, the defense had picked it up from them on 927 of 2023. And then uh, he also testified that Woodhouse had only received the itemized list and did not have the full... Uh, full thumb drive or any photos. So uh, Mullen actually, it was pretty interesting because on cross, um, Hennessy asked him if he ever read the email because he was asking him, Hennessy wanted to establish or to prove that this was an intentional leak by Andy, that the body of the email was addressed to Brad, his partner on the case, Rosie. And, um, Mullen's like, yeah, no, I didn't actually read the email. <laughs> He's, you know, which I thought it was, it was funny. It was, it was just kind of funny. Like to me, the whole, that whole motion was funny. Um, so he's like, you know, and, and ultimately he says, after watching the YouTube video, he contacts McClellan and he informs him. Um, and McClellan said, Hey man, document it. Like M McClellan at the, at that point in time, wasn't like, Oh my God. Oh my God. You know what I mean? It's like, it, he didn't think it was a big deal. So, um, Mullen didn't know the date that the email was sent from Baldwin to Woodhouse. Um, and then, you know, I think Hennessy, uh, across had argued that the PCA, um, like, like this is when Hennessy starts like kind of throwing stuff in there, like that the Gary Bodette guy, that the PCA had already been leaked. Um, and in terms of, like, I think it was during an objection in terms of, you know, that containing a lot more information than the itemized list did, which is true. It did. I mean, the itemized list is just like CD, CD, you know, I mean, it had some witness names, but like that was as much information as you're getting out of that. Um, so that, that was kind of it for him. Um, they got a few exhibits in. They put the thumb drive map into uh, into evidence. Um, they put uh, the receipt of evidence that was signed, talking about how the defense had gotten the, the uh, discovery from them. And then um, three 
I can't remember what it was, and I didn't write it down, but um, Gull didn't allow the third exhibit to be admitted in. And um, ultimately, we then get to uh, like who I consider to be the main witness, which was uh, Indiana State Trooper Jerry Holman. And Holman at that point gets up there and he said that in early October, he testifies in early October that he received an email from McClellan informing him that, um, oh wait, who, who had reached out to him? Let me see, what, see, I can't even read my transcript of my notes. Uh, let me see. Okay. Oh, it was Becky Patty. Okay. So yeah, I put the initials in there. I'm like, who's BP? So it was Becky Patty. So um, in October of 2023, Holman testifies that he received an email from McLean, uh, from McLeanland informing him that Becky Patty had reached out uh, to McLeanland about the leaks. And, and it, like, and I'm assuming everybody that's watching tonight knows who all the players are. McLeanland is the prosecutor. Holman is one of the investigating uh state indiana state troopers um becky patty is family um of the victims and obviously brad uh rosie and andy baldwin are defense attorneys and judge gull is obviously the judge i'm assuming you guys all know that but i might as well say it just in case you don't in case you're just dropping in and you have no idea what this case is about which i do see people doing occasionally um so ultimately he testifies that after receiving the email from McClellan, Holman receives a call um, from uh, Anya and Kevin of the, the murder sheet pod. And um, he didn't really know the dates. He said, but he wasn't sure how soon after he got the impression it could have been the same day. He wasn't sure if it was the same day or the next day. I think according to their podcast, it was the next day. Um so during that phone call, he testifies that like there was a lot of talk about Kevin and Anya during uh, like this part portion of Holman's testimony and about how like they, you know, whatever they put in their their podcast on that episode about the leak, um, that they described the photos to Holman and based on their descriptions that he believed some of the photos that were shown to him by the defense during his death. So after uh, Murder Sheet provided Holman with what they received, Holman said he knew it came from the defense because part of the photos that had been blocked out, the privates, the girls, had been blocked out with a black circle. Uh, Holman says that his team uses rectangles, not circles. So that's the whole circle rectangle thing, uh, which people are all trying to figure out. You, you know, it's like that part of it, <clears throat> it was mildly interesting, you know, because it, it just kind of starts my like the inference made by the defense was because when Rosie ends up testifying, he's like, I, I hadn't seen some of those pictures, you know, like I, I hadn't seen anything with a circle on it, meaning at the depths when he was using them, which would mean that they weren't his, like that they weren't made by the defense. That's what the insinuation was. Ultimately, like one, one of my bigger issues with all of this is the investigation really proved nothing. Like they didn't get anything of, you know, any smoking gun evidence of anything other than this thing went down basically how everybody thinks it did, maybe. <laughs> and remember, Westerman's not there to testify. Like the only person that I would have liked to, like, because like you guys know, the only thing that I care about with this leak, and I've said it multiple times, is what was Westerman's motive? Like what caused him to do this? You know, I, I just, I had to know. Like that's, this, it's the only thing I care about. Because I just, because that answer, um, that answer gives us what we really want to know. You know, and, and like you guys know, I'm always saying, um, reading some of the comments here. Uh, and I'm always saying, like, you know, who did the leak benefit at the end of the day? You know, like, who did it benefit? And to me, it's clear who it benefited. 
you know, it put a stop to the, the threat of trial happening on January 8th. Um, you know, and if you're using your common sense, that would benefit. Like if the defense is saying they're ready, we know that a leak's not benefiting them. They're not going to put out crime scene photos when they're trying to go to trial in like two months because that makes everybody hate your client. And they, you know, it, it angers everybody seeing those photographs would just anger everybody. So, you know, the only person that benefited was McClelland because it, it, it put a, you know, just put a halt onto it. Um, so I don't know. Um, so ultimately we have, so yeah, like if Westerman would have been there, I would have been like, Ooh, now we're talking. Now we're, now we're going to get somewhere. But it's like, when I think about the whole Westerman thing, you know, it's like Andy Baldwin must have gone to him. Like after this thing comes out and he's like, Oh my God, dude, like, are you, I thought you were my boy. You know, you like completely fucked me here. It's like, I'm sorry, dude. You know, I don't know what came over me, whatever was said. And he's like, you have to write an affidavit. You know, you've got to, you got to fess this thing up. You're going to let me go down for your bullshit. You know? So he writes the affidavit, you know, and, um, <laughs> yeah, right. This is, this is actually the truth. <laughs> This is actually Sleuthy's always she's always on top of her shit. Um, so all right, but I digress. I'm getting off track. Westerman didn't testify, so why even pontificate about it? All right, so um, so at that point, uh, like I said, you know, Rosie's talking about the the whole black circle thing, and you know, but Holman says that his team only uses rectangles, not circles, so that's how he figured out came from the defense you know and he thought he remembered it from the depths um and like i'm not going to go through much of rosie's testimony because in my mind like what ends up happening after the states put all their evidence on is hennessy kind of does what you do during a regular trial like after the state's case in chief is done you know you you we call it a motion for a directed finding or a directed verdict here and that he did the same thing. And he's like, look, like everything that this guy just put on, McClellan just put on, none of it had anything to do with Brad Rosie. So like, I'm asking you right now to just dismiss it as to Brad Rosie. Cause like he clearly, like there was no evidence that he did anything. So how are you holding him in contempt? You know? And then, well, I'll, and then he, he said, he tries to make the same argument for, you know, but it's more of a willful, there was no willfulness shown by the state as to to um, to Baldwin and, and the judge is like, look, there's a ton of stuff in terms of screen grabs and things like that that were entered into evidence. And she, she's like, I'm not going to make a ruling until after I read these things. And then when he's trying to make the argument about Baldwin, she shuts him down. Like he wants to make a record and she's like, I know what your argument's going to be, so you don't have to do it. So just I'm denying it right now because I have to read through all this stuff before I can make a decision. It's kind of an interesting little little thing. Yeah, people were, I guess when I was thinking about it last night, you know, like to me, she was just acting like at this point, like a normal judge does to defense attorneys. I mean, typically judges are not not very pleasant to defense attorneys. It's just kind of like like she just seemed like, she was being normal <laughs> in this. It's like, I guess it's hard for people to understand we don't practice law, like in terms of, cause like her, his, you know, her history in this case makes you think, well, God, she was being like, she was continuing to be shitty, you know, but when she ends up not doing anything with respect to, you know, cause I keep kind of jumping ahead, but it's just cause I'm so bored with this. <laughs> this portion of like this motion just sucked. Um, happened to hear about the murder sheets leak and the pictures. It was like, all oh, just like, oh my God, I don't care. Um, all right. So, uh, he goes on to testify that murder sheet informed Holman that they'd received the photos from Cohen. Um, Holman received five uh, crime scene photos from murder sheet. Um, and I know 
I know I saw people saying that they got more. I'm sure they turned over what they had. Like, I don't know where the whole printed out that they had printed out stuff. That that was different. So they, I thought that they said they had deleted it. Um, so Holman says that Cohen never shared these photos publicly um, or to anyone that uh, other than Murder Sheet, which I don't think is correct. Um, I, I think that that was Fortson. Because I, I think that Fortson was... Um, I think ultimately it went from Westerman to Fort Fortson and then Fortson to Cohen. And the word on the street is that Cohen um, is the one who spread them out around out, out a little bit to the other folks. So Holman then interviews Cohen, Snay, uh, security Bruin. Um, Holman learned from Fortson's father that Fortson worked in an Air Force base. That he was likely there. So then, you know, this was this was interesting. And I kind of wish, Allie, are you still in the room? I guess she went upstairs. She said she was going to listen. She must have crept out. Um, so while he's at the base, Fortson informs Holman, which we saw in the defense filing, that um, he wanted an attorney. You know, he said it five or six times. I want to talk to a consultant attorney. You know, the question becomes, I mean, technically this is a criminal investigation, theoretically. So, you know, I, I think he absolutely had a right at that point in his mind um, to lawyer up, you know, in which case Holman should have shut it down, like any kind of questioning, um, you know, and, and Holman kept, you know, the kind of the one thing that never came out of this w was was Holman asking questions and was Fortson answering or was Holman just threatening him? It kind of seemed to me that after Fortson had lawyered up that Holman wasn't so much asking him questions, but that he was trying to bully him into talking by threatening him with calling Gull, saying he's going to be held in contempt and go to jail. You know, so it's not like he was saying, okay, where did you get the pictures? And, you know, he didn't continue questioning. He just kind of continued trying to intimidate him. Um, ultimately, uh, you know, he ends up not really telling him anything. And, um, you know, that's when Holman does the whole thing. I'm going to go call the judge. I came out. Holman admitted, yeah, I did tell him I was going to call the judge. I really wouldn't call him to Cleveland. And, um, you know. I came back and said words, trying to uh, like, and I think it the, like, I, and I, I wasn't really clear. And just so I'm like abundantly clear about this, I am not a court reporter. It was really hard to hear in there because the acoustics were. They have like a probably a fifty foot ceiling with like a glass stained glass dome, and. They had a mic on the witness stand, but no one was using it. It was like like a foot in front of the people's mouths and those mics in courtrooms. You got to kind of really talk into them. So it was like Hennessy couldn't hear anything. He'd ask a question that the witness would answer. He'd say, what? I, just, I thought it was I thought it was hilarious because it was just it was, I was like, what, what, what? Like right after the witness would say something, the judge hated it. Like that's like I'm sure people have been talking about. She's like, "Do you need a, uh, you know, a, a hearing device?" <laughs> she asks him in court. He's like, "No, you're ridiculous." Reminds me, like, like reminded me of my grandfather, who refused to wear his his, uh, his hearing aids, <laughs> although the whole way the guy just refused to. <laughs> like everybody around him was like, "God, we're so sick of repeating ourselves. Just put your hearing aids in." My grandfather's like, "No, I'm good. I'm not gonna do it." You can't make me. He was very vain. My grandfather didn't want to wear the hearing aids. It's kind of like me with my reading glasses. I just need to put those things on. I'm old. just need to accept it. Um, so then ultimately, um, at some point, and I, I just like in my notes, it's not clear when Holman becomes like in the know that it's uh, Westerman and Fortson that have the relationship, you know, 
Um, and it turns out that both those guys were in the Air Force together and that they were friends. So that was that relationship. Um, and then, you know, it, it, like in McClellan this whole time, it, it, like was insinuating that there was an ongoing leak. So like that was the only thing that he had like switched up. Like this had turned in from like, like the isolated leak where Westerman snuck in and got the pictures to this being an ongoing leak, meaning that, and the insinuation was, even though they didn't have any evidence of it, because apparently they can't get into Westerman's phone, um, that Andy was, when he would consult with Westerman, which again, you know, that's part of the, what, what Hennessy puts on in rebuttal on his case, it, like you, you don't, there's nothing wrong with brainstorming with attorneys, non-attorneys, you know, lay people about, about your, your theory of the case or your trial strategies, you know, cause you, you want to, you want to know if it's going to stick. You want to know if something that you're saying, you know, in terms of your theory is like going to be received by lay people and, well, I'll get to that when I'm skimming through what, what they put on Tennessee. Um, so then he, uh, Holman testifies that he learned uh, Miss uh, Islandfelt uh, had photos on her phone that she had received from um, somebody, <laughs> somebody named TC. Uh, and then Holman learned that um, somebody else had, like, so he starts finding out all these people have photos. And it kind of like, uh, it, you know, at that point, like Hennessy is making note of this because he's going to kind of counter at the end of the day, McClellan's kind of bigger argument. He makes the, the, you know, the prosecutor argument that, you know, that the most important thing to him was making sure that all of these leaked photos were collected and destroyed because he didn't want the families to be, you know, exposed to these, which is, which is, I'm, I'm sure true. I, I think that that stands that like, and when I'm saying that that's a prosecutor's office, that's an uh, argument that that's really an argument that all of us, I think, want, no, no one wants the family to run into those things. But the problem was from his perspective is that all these other people that received them, that Holman found out about, he never went and spoke to him and he never got the pictures from them. So if, if that was the directive from McClellan was to gather all these things per goal, because remember McClellan stated that judge goal was adamant of, of getting these things out of circulation. So, you know, so that became his mission, but the problem is, is that they never followed up with it. They left people out there that still have these things as far as we know. So that kind of flies in the face of what McClellan's arguing about that. Um, man, I just wish this was interesting. Like, I wish I was interested in this particular motion. I'm just not. Does it show? I'm trying to pretend like I'm kind of interested, but I'm, I'm going to let you in on a secret. I'm not. I'm not interested at all. Um, all right. So according to Holman, the chain of leaks began with uh, Westerman sending the stuff Fortson and Fortson being the one to disseminate through Facebook and Reddit. Um, Holman says that he learned of Iron's passing on 10 12 uh, 23. Holman says that he's seen the Westerman affidavit and there's no evidence of any authorization from Bus. So he admits he, like on cross, he admits that um, there's no evidence that there was any authorization, uh, authorization for Baldwin or Rosie to access the war room or to share the, the information with anybody. So he, and that's kind of it, right? Like, isn't that the kind of the main thing? That's that's kind of how the Holman thing wraps up on cross. And that's all I'm going to spend on it. So, again, if you guys want to dig in, like, I, I know a lot of content creators have been focusing on this motion um, because they don't know any better, apparently. Not you, Teresa. Like, everyone I'm talking about, the ones, that, like, the YouTubers that, like, somehow got sucked into this. I'm sure that they've been trying to cover this all day. I didn't watch any of it obviously, because I don't care. I only watch Teresa's because I love Teresa. Um, all right, so then they call Ben Rector, who's another Indiana State Police detective. 
And uh, he was asked to locate, he was testifies that he was uh, asked to locate uh, Woodhouse after Holman learned of the YouTube video. He was also tasked with interviewing uh, Rosie Baldwin. Baldwin informed Rector on 10-9 that he received a text, uh, text from Ruffalo Westerman saying that he needed to talk to Baldwin. Um, Westerman at that time informed Baldwin of the photos that he had taken. Baldwin then informed Rector that he had previously discussed strategy with him as well and that he had shared the Franks memo. Uh, with Baldwin one to two days before filing the Franks. Now, nothing came out about by either side that that included the exhibits. Like I, I saw that floating around out there because I think uh, McClellan had written that in one of his responses. That wouldn't have been true. Like, it, had he sent him the pictures, you know, like, I'm sure he would have sent out more. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, like, if he had done this back in August, if he had snuck in, because we know that the the memo didn't get filed to the 18th. You know, it's like he would have, he would have sent, he would have had everything. Like, if he would have sent, he would have had over 150 different ex exhibits of all kinds of stuff, way more than just the photos stuff that was way more more interesting from the perspective of potential innocence or guilt as to rick allen and the photographs if he had all that stuff like that would like th that would have been a massive leak like like it had that happened had like just a mountain of actual evidence been sent to westerman who was already leaking that would have been catastrophic so I didn't hear, unless I missed something, I, I did not hear any evidence that that actually occurred. So whatever the Cleveland said about that, um, they weren't able to prove it up. Um, and then so uh, they also testify um, that, uh, so, it, and that was basically it for their case. Like I'm talking about the state's case. So then, he makes, um, he kind of makes his argument. Well, no, he doesn't. So, so then at that point, uh, Hennessy puts on his witnesses and he puts on the three, three attorneys, um, who were all very interesting. You know, I mean, they were all, they were all kind of old school attorneys. All of them had tried a bunch of cases. All of them testified that yes, we all have a war room. No, none of us lock our war room. No, none of us ever would think that somebody would come in and do that in a case, which I was saying months ago, you know, like whenever I did the thing with the prosecutors, I'm like, man, like we have a war room and that's, we, we'd stick things on cork boards and there's shit everywhere. It's how we have to prepare for trial. It's like, I don't, you know, we have people sign NDAs that work in our office, you know, but it's like, like, I don't, I'm not locking the door. You never think to do that. You know, I mean, you never think that there's going to be some weirdo that's going to be creeping in and, and, and like taking pictures of dead children. You just don't think that somebody's going to do that. I'm sorry, but you know, it's like that, that whole thing just like kind of, you know, people keep trying to like compare it to medical records and that's protected by federal law. And, and it's, it's not that. Like discovery that we get in cases and we have 50, 60 cases that we're handling at a time. You know, it's like it's a very different thing. And, and this isn't privileged information, like in terms of attorney client privilege, meaning that it's not something that my client's telling me. This is evidence presented by the state to us that they're trying to use to convict our client. So it's, it's very, it's like, I, I've never heard anybody give a good analogy of what this is, you know? And it was like, and again, I think whoever would do this is a total scumbag. Flat out. You know, I mean, Allison and I had people offering us these things and we're like, I, why would I want those? Like literally, like, like, I, like plus I didn't believe them anyway. You know, I'm like, I'm like, I think you're just another person trying to say you have these. Like, I don't know how I like, 
like that was my thing. I, I just kept thinking, I'm like, how many of these people are full of shit? Because they're trying to be weirdly relevant and saying that they got the leak. You know, I was like, and if you don't think that there's people out there that do that, guess again, <laughs> there's definitely people out there that do that. Um, all right, so Rector continues on. Um, and he's ultimately saying that, uh, Oh, no. So you know, I was telling director, so I'm sorry. Uh, so Hennessy, see, these are my, my transcript is brutal. It kind of follows my notes, which were kind of, you know, like haphazard because you're trying to keep up because they say a lot of words. So you're trying to figure out what are the key points to what they're saying. Um, and I'm not a fast writer. So it's like as much as as much as I can get down, <laughs> I got down, especially for emotion I didn't care about. Um, so ultimately, uh, the defense, like I said, they put on three attorneys and they're talking about what's, what was their habit, you know, and again, they brainstorm with other attorneys all the time. They brainstorm with non-attorneys, you know, kind of the thought process being you want a lay person's perspective to see if what you're trying to float is going to stick, you know, and, and like people that don't understand, like. If, if you're wondering how Baldwin could speak with Fortson or not Fortson Westerman about trial strategy without giving him like detailed information in terms of like things that are under, uh, you know, under the protective order. I mean, you use like hypotheticals, you know, I mean, that's what Alice and I always do. You know, we're always like, all right, this is a hypothetical. You know, you don't have to give like the the dirty the dirty secret facts of everything, you know. But ultimately, and I take no issue with him sharing a public what was going to be a publicly filed motion. I mean, that was that was public. That wasn't you didn't know, and obviously that document includes facts, you know, that are in evidence. But I was explaining to people online yesterday, I'm like, you know, there, there's this thought process that, you know, the defense is using their motions to, to get around the, the seal or the protective order, and the gag, to get facts about the case out. And there's some truth to that. Like, like the body of the, like and it's not so much about the evidence; it's it's more about their theory of defense. Like that, they did they use that to get their theory of defense out. Which again, like I, I've stated, I'm good with it. You know, I mean, the state always gets to get theirs out. What's good for the goose, good for the gander. Like who said? Like, aren't we oppressed enough by the state? Don't they have more resources and power anyway? Like, like why can't we even the scales of justice by getting our theory out? I don't see a problem with it. I don't have a problem with it at all. And as far as evidence coming out in a in a publicly filed pleading, that's how attorneys speak to the judge. Okay, so that's how McClellan speaks to the judge. That's how defense attorneys speak to the judge when you're trying to to argue an issue. You have to give factual scenarios. You know, you have to put this stuff out. You know, and there's no reason for it to be sealed. Like, there just isn't. Like, this whole concept that this entire case needs to be hidden from the public is bizarre to me. You know, it just is. It's like, I don't understand it. Like, the more they try to hide it, the more I think it's suspicious, frankly. So, but like, in any case, like, we're always, when we're, like, when we file a motion to suppress, the way that we make our argument to the judge is in our pleading. So if we're saying that a cop violated somebody's Fourth Amendment rights, we lay out the entire scenario of what happened. Okay, we say, okay, yeah, the cop pulled this guy over, you know, and whether we're saying that they didn't have probable cause to pull him over, whatever the case may be, you know, whatever we're attacking, if we're attacking it for you know, the search of an automobile that we're saying that they didn't have probable cause to pull them over for. We have to lay out all the facts, including what they find in evidence in the car and everything else. 
then we cite the law saying that this is why it violated his constitutional rights. You know, so I mean that like these motions are where we speak to the judge. So you're always going to hear facts. And like I was saying, like typically a judge never hears about the evidence. Like I said, I've, I've said it a few lives back. The judge isn't sitting there with an entire copy of the discovery. Quite the opposite. They don't know they're, you know, they don't know anything about the evidence other than when motions are filed. Then they'll come privy, you know, they'll be privy to, to some of the evidence. But again, remember, that's what their their role is during the pretrial stages. They're the gatekeeper of what comes in and what stays out. So obviously they're going to hear of some of that evidence, you know, and that's part of the, the challenge of being a judge is you can't let that evidence like that you learn about during the gatekeeping role sway you, you know, in terms of later on during trial having to make rulings in terms of objections or letting things in and out. You know, you don't want them becoming biased and thinking somebody's guilty because of the evidence that they've seen pre-trial. And, and I don't, like, I think most judges are good at that. They understand that that's their duty. You know, I, I think that they, they really try to abide by that as much as humanly possible. You know, there's always that, that thing of, you know, that we're all human. <laughs> so I don't know how much that, you know, really affects them, but it's, it's limited in terms of what they're hearing. But, you know, I mean, it can like, like in a lot of our cases, judges would hear a lot about a lot of evidence prior to going to trial. So, you know, and it's but you just get used to losing as a defense attorney, like motions and trials. I mean, you you, you lose a lot more than you win. I mean, there's a couple of exceptions in terms of defense attorneys who I think were super picky about the cases they took. But, it, you know, I mean, it's like. You know, you get you get a client that is adamant about going to trial when you know that there's no way you can win it, and it's not your choice. You go to trial. You have to go to trial. Like you, you have other lawyers that like can select that are either convincing all of their clients that they know are going to be guilty just to plead out, so that's not on their table, and they only take to trial the cases that they know that they can win. You know, I mean, that's how you win trials as a defense attorney. That's where you have more winning than losing, you know, but it's like, and you just never know what a jury's going to do. All right. So then uh, after, after Rector testified, they, they, you know, like I said, at that point, that was their, their case. Hennessy makes the argument um, and he cites state, state v. Shoemaker. Uh, and he's basically saying that, you know, it's got to be beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, that they didn't show willfulness. And then that's when Judge Gall says all the stuff like, well, you know, I got to look through all of these exhibits. There was a lot of stuff that was entered. I can't make a, any kind of judgment until then. Um, and then, you know, as he makes his argument as to Rosie and the Baldwin, Rosie, that none of this had anything to do with him. Baldwin, you know, and, and like Rosie testified, Baldwin didn't. You know, and, and that's when all the stuff came out about the, the squares and the, or the rectangles and the circles. And Rosie just saying, like, I I didn't know about any of this stuff. Like, when I found out about it, then I let the judge know. You know, and there, there was other testimony about, you know, they had asked um, all the other, the three seasoned attorneys, you know, like, if they had sent, I forgot, that they if they had ever sent misdirected emails, they were all like, oh, yeah do it you know like what do you do afterwards well you know we try to send an email out saying hey please please disregard or if it had sensitive material you know do me a favor delete that you know what do they do when they receive it they do the same thing they send it back hey i don't think that this is supposed to be sent to us and you know so all that kind of stuff and then ultimately um so what the judge decides to do on that thing and the only part that I was a little bit tense about was this, like when she's, when I'm, I'm waiting to see if she's going to rule on it from the bench. And as soon as she didn't, as soon as she said, because right, right after that, that's like, because you could tell Hennessy at that point was like, was over it. You know, it had been a long day for him. Big courtroom. He was having a hard time hearing what the witnesses were saying. He had to keep walking back and forth to the lectern, which was a lot, a lot of up and down in his chair. 
he's a senior. You know, it was like it was a taxing day for him. I could tell he was he was done. He wasn't loving it. Um, you know, and ultimately, uh, you know, she says, look, and he asked to, to be able to write a memo of law, which she then grants. As soon as she granted him seven days and then said, like I said early on, and said that McClelland had seven days to respond to that and then gave herself 30 days, which leaves us at May 1st, 13 days before trial. I knew she wasn't doing anything that was going to affect this trial going forward. So it was a big sigh of relief for me. Um, it really was. I was very, very, uh, I was very excited about that. Um, like, I, I mean, do you guys really want me to talk about Henry? Like I kind of skipped Hennessy's whole case. It was like, he called Julie Melvin and he called Steve Wood, Skip Jansen, I guess is his screen name. Like Melvin couldn't get anything in because it wasn't relevant. Um, Skip got a few things in about Fig. Uh, he recalled Holman to the stand, uh, and then he called Rosie. Right. So after that, it was basically the state's closing and defense's closing. So let me check the chat and see if you guys are satisfied with that. Like, I'm just like, I'm not feeling this thing. All right. So you guys tell me, do you want more or is that sufficient for that motion? Cause I'm already in an hour 12 and I wanted to talk for like five minutes about that thing. All right, let's see. All right, you guys, you guys chat so much. And I put a 15 second thing on here too. And you guys still are going at it. No more leak stuff. Yes. Now move on. Yes. Sufficient. No. Okay. Oh, different Hennessy, my bad. Okay, okay, good, 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 good. All right, all right, good. Thank you. Ah, I feel, I feel that you have given me a pardon from that. I'm, I'm like already in a better mood. Um, all right. So then, then we get into what I was really looking for. Uh, again, I, I was excited about hearing this because, frankly, um, in a year and a half, and, and just so you know. Goal had said early on that, look, because like Ball, I can't remember if it was Ball or Hennessy's, you know, they're like, this may take two days. And, and Goal is like, or she might have been addressing the motion. And he's like, she's like, I, I scheduled this for one day. And that means this is only going one day. That's it. So I, you know, that, that is like you plan accordingly. So like, I kept looking at my watch. I'm like, Oh my God, like, we're not going to get to the, like, they're going to get screwed on this motion to dismiss, which I think they did a, a little bit in terms of Miss <laughs> Smith. We give her pardon an hour and a half. <laughs> oh, she was reading the comments. Um, so let's see. Uh, Wait, I saw something about my mic. Somebody said, you guys can hear me, right? Can we tell uh, Bob now to turn on the mic? My mic's on, right? You guys are kidding, right? You guys can hear me. Um, all right. So, so what, like I was saying, so like, I, like, you know, this thing goes to lunch break. We, we like get to lunch break and, you know, it's like, I couldn't go eat and whatever. I'm going to whine about that a little more because we all lost our spots. And then check my text. You guys, like my mods who I love, you guys know that I don't check my text very well. Let me see. Um, I'm not sure, but your sound not normal. Is your mic on? Oh, you know what? Like an idiot, I probably didn't hook. Oh, hold on. Let me see. God damn it. I'm about to be way better. Boop. No, wrong one. That's better, isn't it? Yeah. I was you were you guys were right. You guys were right. I wish I would have been looking at my text. I was not using my mic mic. <laughs> yeah. This is where I end the stream. It sounds yeah. So I, I was using my my thingy. <laughs> my uh my Mac mic. Ah yeah. Yeah. Damn, I wish I would have been looking. 
So Darren's going to be pissed about me using the uh, the Mac mic instead of my good mic. Because the good mic really sounds what I sound like. You know, like that other thing sounds tinny and shit. All right. Uh, thank you guys for letting me know that. I'm glad I would. I'm glad I saw that. Um, you guys know I will never, um, you know, be good with tech <laughs> ever. It's like, I'm, like, there's no going back on that. All right. I'm just too old. Okay. So like I said, I I'm getting nervous as we come back from lunch and like hennessy has got to put all his people on and I'm like, man, you know, how long, how long is this going to take? Like I asked Hennessy, he's like, it's easy. It's going to take as long as it needs to. <laughs> and I'm like, oh man, I'm like, well, you know, what about this motion to dismiss like that? We really want to hear that. Right. So, um, at that point, like after that thing's wrapped, then Baldwin handles the motion to dismiss. And so I was super excited about this because as I said, this was the first thing in a year and a half that um, really has something to do with the trial. It's like, we've gone a year and a half in this case. And this is the first, what I would consider to be like everything substantive, like under the definition of substantive in terms of if you're asking the judge to do something like that, that technically is what they would consider a substantive motion. This was like really substantive. Like this was a motion that was going to be for like actually heard instead of her denying it without hearing to where we were going to get to hear stuff that had to do with the case. So, and like I said, like, like I have, I went into this knowing there's no way in hell she's granting this like zero chance that this is going to get granted it's just not happening um it's it's really hard like even if it wasn't gall it's just really hard to win a motion to dismiss on a case like this like no judge is willing to let a potential guilty person of you know double homicide walk based on some evidence being you know whether it was by accident or intentional being destroyed by by the state <laughs> like they're, they're just not going to do it they're you know they're not going to do it and I, I know ali and i discussed it a long time ago you know in terms of the fact that there existed summaries of what was said in the interviews theoretically she was going to find that to be sufficient which i'm sure if she writes an opinion that's what she's going to say i have a feeling she'll just deny it with hearing upon hearing i'm denying it uh, but so at any rate, I still loved this hearing and, and I, and I heard what murder sheet was saying about Todd click, that it was all pointless in terms of, you know, what the hearing was for. And the reason that it was important and it's, and it's a shame that it wasn't heard by the public at large, because for me personally, it's like, I read the memo. I heard about this guy click, but it's an entirely different thing to have him come in, get sworn in, and then tell his story. And I completely disagree with what Kevin and Anya said yesterday on the thing with the prosecutors. This guy told his whole story and, and told it with Holman Carter staring him in the face you know what i mean it was like to me it was like a, a moment in time where you've got because law enforcement does not typically play well together you know they just don't you know and unified command for whatever reason had decided to abandon the you know like any kind of real investigation into the the angle of norse paganism or that that could somehow play into this thing and, um, you know, so I, I, I found it to be very compelling because it was a preview of what we're going to see a trial. Cause I guarantee you 1 million percent that that click is going to, um, he's going to be testifying at trial. So, uh, so they put him on 
And just so you know, so Todd Click, in case you guys are newer to this, you don't know anything about it, you know, back in September of last year, the defense filed their uh, motion for Frank's hearing and the accompanying memorandum, which was very lengthy, 106, 136 pages long. And in that, they talked about these three cops that had continued to investigate, um, you know, what they felt was a very strong avenue of investigation, which was some white nationalists that had kind of co-opted Norse paganism religion and, and that they felt that they were responsible for these homicides. And um, early on, uh, Unified Command, which was kind of the core group of law enforcement that was heading the investigation, abandoned that. But these three cops, you know, Click, Ferenczi, and Murphy continued on with it for a long time, for a really long time, up until Ferenczi was shot and killed. Um, they continued to, to really dig into this. So, and just so you have understand, um, so Click was a former Rushville police officer for like 20, 20 plus years. And Rushville is a, a town, obviously, that's not Delphi. So, you know, like when he was brought in, so he, um, he starts with his testimony, which to me was super fascinating. Um, and he really, you know, he really started like, clarifying things that were a little bit fuzzy in terms of the memo with respect to where he stood you know because there was a lot of chatter out there that click was thought that you know he was of the position that people were taking the position that the click wasn't on board with how far the defense went with it and i came away from his testimony that he was on board with it and that he believes it like he, be he believes that that is the proper angle still to this day so so he originally gets involved in the case uh he testifies that um elvis fields was interviewed at rushville pd in um june of 2018 and and that was kind of like how he got involved with it and um you know and he knew fields because fields is a rushville guy so like fields is like a dude that's been around for a long time getting in trouble you know like he's he's a known dude down in rushville um has never done anything like horrific um you know but he's a guy that's well known to law enforcement so at that point, uh, Click is asked by Ferency and Murphy to see if he can find any connections between Brad Holder and Patrick Westfall with Elvis Fields. And he basically testifies, which he didn't find much, which we knew from the memo. But he ends up finding a photo on Holder's Facebook page with everybody wearing Vinderlander shirts on and it was it, like in Indiana, they allow the, you know, the prosecution and the defense to kind of inquire into um, the witnesses while they're on direct. So I, I think that um, the attorney Dean or asked, she's like, well, how did you know that they were Vinlander shirts? And he's like, well, they said Vinlanders, which was a funny moment. Like, like a lot of the courtroom chuckled a little bit. Um, so then click. Uh, recognized um, Johnny Messer standing between Brand Holder and Patrick Westfall. Now, Johnny Messer is another Rushville guy. And Click testified that Messer was known to him as somebody who was in and out of Rushville jail quite often. So, like, he knew of Fields and he definitely knew of Johnny Messer. Now, so this connected Holder and Westfall to Rushville, but it didn't necessarily uh, necessarily connect them to Elvis Fields. And then at that point, um, he testifies, he gets into, um, he starts talking about Johnny Messer and that um, Johnny, an ex of Johnny Messer's uh, woman named Taylor 
um, he interviewed her and um, she had a, a bunch of photos of meetings and outings with their Vinlander group. And a lot of the photos included Messer, Westfall and Holder. So like that crew is established, right? Like that is like, they're, they're a crew that's established. Um, and the same acts provided evidence of Messer and another individual kidnapping someone at gunpoint. That that's the thing that I made the mistake at. So that that's the dude. And, and I'm assuming, and I, I don't know it's a hundred percent, but it, it, it sure it lines up with that story. The, the warrant that click prepared um that ultimately was you know it was a, a drug deal gone bad like messer was out and bunny and he was taking this dude hostage in order to make sure that he got paid the cash i think it was like four grand or something like that um and then so um like that was kind of bombshell stuff that like like in and of itself it's not connected to delphi right i mean it has like like i, I like the thing I felt bad about is like if anybody, if I wasn't clear last night that this, I wasn't insinuating in any, any way, shape, or form, anybody in that courtroom knew that he wasn't talking about that he had evidence of, of him kidnapping the girls on on his phone in the form of audio or video. I think it was audio ultimately. Um, like that is that was not. I, I don't think I said that last night at all. Um, but like some people, like I was reading in the chat, or like getting that takeaway that that is not what was on there what was on there and what i was trying to explain on twitter today is that it, it shows that he's capable of doing things like like me and i don't know about the rest of you like i like i'm not taking anybody by gunpoint against their will like ever like it's not like you know i'm not capable of it it's not like it's not the kind of thing i can do or would do um so you know to me that showed that it's a pretty depraved act and um you know to me that that like it, it didn't matter if it was a guy or a girl like like that part of it didn't matter to me the, the fact of the matter what what resonated with me was the fact that he did that and thought that it was a good idea to record the audio of it i guess <laughs> So, so that's kind of like a, like kind of a bombshell moment in there. And, and, and so during this entire time, while click is testifying, like, just so you have an idea of how this argument went, you know, McClelland or it wasn't McClelland, a uh, Dean or the attorney was objecting constantly and, and saying, look, like none of this is relevant. Like this motion that we're here in on is a motion as to whether or not we, the state, deliberately, in bad faith, destroyed potentially exculpatory evidence. And what he's talking about with all of this stuff, with Elvis Fields, like what does Elvis Fields have to do with whether or not we purposefully destroyed this evidence and so like andy's baldwin's counter argument to it which is it's like the kind of argument that i would make because defense attorneys look at things in a broader way whereas i think prosecutors tend to look more myopically at it you know like like he like Baldwin's making more of an esoteric argument in that he's saying, look, like we have, like one of the things that we have to show in order to win this motion is that the state was acting in bad faith. And that's really hard to do. Like, I don't have access to any other stuff. I can't get in there and, and start digging around in you know, try to find, so like, they're not going to tell me, <laughs> you know, so that's, you know, that's not lost on me as a defense attorney. I'm like, it's, it's absolutely true. It's, it's going to be near impossible to show that they did it in bad faith. So what he tried to do by putting all of this stuff in 
is he's trying to put forth how compelling that all of this evidence was that they had all of this stuff that was pointing to other individuals okay because there really was no proof like and they couldn't establish proof that this particular video override happened on you know february 14th through i think it was the 17th or it might have been the 20th let me see if i put that in my notes like there like there was no way for them to prove it because the defense didn't hear about the override that they didn't have the video for up until long after Allen's arrested you know and, and the question becomes like that was a big part of the argument when we get to the state's defense of it when they put the cop on mullen that's who they they put on they they put poor steve mullen on the stand to take the beating you know about how this how this could happen and so you know like i mean do you guys get that argument like they're, they're trying and they're trying to say like baldwin's trying to argue that like when you have all this evidence and like for whatever reason they decided to abandon it that that's the reason that this holder interview got deleted and that it was purposefully because they had decided not to take this approach and you know it, it like that this was done as part and parcel of saying hey you know like we don't need them to have this interview we're just going to get rid of it and we're just going to you know we'll write a statement out as to what like a summary statement as to what was said you know so i like i understood what he was doing like like and you do have to kind of go in a roundabout way in order to make this argument work you have to get the judge to believe all right like i'm hearing this stuff and it's compelling like it, it like it, it makes me wonder like you want the judge saying like why didn't they look into this more you know like why and i think that the other reason why he did it and it was kind of telling in his third frank's motion which baldwin drew up is that he says your honor i'm going to ask you officially in my motion to reread the Frank's memo. Like, so Baldwin is pretty convinced that Gull never read that thing ever. And, and I agree with them. I don't think that she did because we had by her own admission on the record, like when she booted those guys that she hadn't read the memo. And if you think for one minute that when they were off the case from October up until the supreme court reinstated him that she decided to read the memo just for shits and giggles you're nuts that did not happen and i don't think that she decided to read it after they got reinstated so i think that this thing tried to serve a bunch of purposes for baldwin in that he wanted to get this evidence in front of the judge more than anybody else baldwin knew this thing wasn't going to be televised you know it's like so that argument from the you know the rest of the the pro pro let's burn Allen at the stake without a trial crowd, you know, that like, they're just trying to get their shit out there. No one's reporting on what, what happened with click yesterday. So like that argument falls on deaf ears. As far as I'm concerned, I think it was really to, to try to get into Gull's head that there exists this, this thing that you heard everybody poo-pooing that you never decided to read the memo is is pretty legitimate you know like this this you know the two attorneys that you appointed after us they think it's got legs and now i'm going to put the cop on that people were trying to say that he didn't think that it was you know all that that the defense was making out to be he does think it's all that you know so like that's why i thought this testimony was important like, and I don't care what anybody else says about it. You know, I mean, did it, did it like directly strike at, was it evidence as to like, they're never going to be able to prove that the state deleted it purposefully. How are they going to do that?
Like there's no way to do it. It's not like you can't do it. There, there is no evidence that you're going to be able to find out. Um, all right. So click keeps testifying. Um, and, and like, so he, he finds this connection. Okay. Between Messer holder and Westfall. Okay. And then they say, all right, now, like, I want you to try to figure out, like, Ferency and Murphy say, like, try to find out if Messer is trying to recruit people into Vinlander. So he does, and he and he talks to a few people, um, talks to a few more people, runs into uh, a couple of people that uh, one game, uh, one guy named Josh, and I'm not going to name his last name, no reason to bring him into it because he's not really named as a guy, uh, a, a guy named Josh who is in this American Guard. Okay, an American Guard is like a, a MAGA-type, you know, white supremacy group, um, and they, they hang with the Vinlanders. And so this Josh says that he attended a MAGA rally in 2016 and that um, they say that he's a Vinlander and he's a friends with um this other guy whose name i just could not catch which i wasn't going to name anyway like i don't need to name these these people i don't need to pull people into it that are not into it but um but this josh dude is a, a semi-truck driver and that like his and he for uh, a company that that transports livestock hogs to be exact and that this guy's route includes um he delivers to Delphi and Logansport. All right. And so it turns out that this guy, he's attending a rally, the MAGA rally is uh, an, an American guard leader um, invites him to a party. So this Josh and this other guy, actually, I, I take that, but they organize a party um, at the other dude, the, the dude whose name starts with an M at his house and for the Vinlanders and the American guards for after the 2016 rally. Now, Brad, it turns out that Brad Holder knows this Josh guy. Um, I don't think that there was any evidence that Holder was at this party. So it then comes out that this Josh guy who was driving semi trucks transporting hogs that elvis fields worked for the same company under the table so there he finds so you've got this josh guy who like knows vinlanders who's knows american guard people and they know that brad holder knows josh and so there's your connection when we find out that Elvis Fields worked for the same company for cash as this Josh. So you've got Brad knowing Josh, Josh knowing Elvis Fields. So that's that's how Elvis Fields could be drawn into this, theoretically. So um, fast forward to... Um, the famous Elvis Fields interview. So like I, I had not known um I had not known that Fields was interviewed at the police station. I knew he was interviewed somewhere, but I didn't know until yesterday that he was actually taken to the police station. So he was interviewed at the police station um by Murphy, okay? And it was after this interview, which they didn't really get into the details of that interview. And this is the whole thing where he turns around and he says, when Murphy's driving him back to his trailer, he turns around and says, Hey, I just wanted to ask you, you know, if you find my spit on one of the girls, you know, but I have a, an explanation. I have a, a you know, a reason why I did it. You know, am I, am I going to be good? You know, so. Like, and he doesn't, like, he wasn't there in terms of, you know, like what, 
it, it, you know, like click doesn't know what Murphy's response was to that. So, yeah, I, yeah, I don't like, I don't know. You know, it's like, <laughs> we don't know what he says. I, I would assume it would be like, he'd drive back and he'd say, all right, um, look, this guy just completely and totally, hold on one sec, y'all. What's up? Oh, are you going to bed? Here, come give me a kiss. All right, hold on, y'all. I got to give, got to give a night night to my little one. All right, sorry, y'all. Uh, that's what happens when I go late. I'm gonna say goodnight to my people. Okay, so um, all right. So, like after that statement's made, um, we then know that and Click interviews both of Field sisters. All right, so he does. Uh, he talks to his one sister, um, Joyce. And this is where Elvis is saying that, you know, that he's got, you know, that he's probably going to be going away for a long time and that he was down at the bridge and, you know, he, he was there when those two girls got killed. And then um, his other sister, Mary, he's sitting there saying, well, you know, look, um, I've done some bad things, these girls, you know, and I placed like some sticks in their hair to look like antlers. And, you know, I like for me, this thing with Elvis Fields has always been mind blowing. You know, I mean, he's making statements that, and, and you know, the one thing that I took from, like the the testimony yesterday from click was that i wish that brad would have asked him or no andy would have asked him whether or not when elvis fields was being interviewed at the station whether or not he can tell us us being the court and the gallery whether or not they brought up any of this uh the specifics of what the crime scene looked like because isn't that ultimately the biggest question right like you know because I, I keep hearing people you know poo-pooing the antlers people that say they saw the pictures and say there's no antlers there and i i talk to people that see the pictures and they say oh there's antlers there you know i don't know i haven't seen them but all i know is that at trial they're going to come out so and if there's sticks in her hair that look like antlers or are trying to resemble antlers or looked that they were like they were purposely placed there and this guy was not fed that information which i can't see why he would be at the police station i mean how are we not looking at this guy is it at the very least being involved like uh, are, are we of the mindset that we're poo-pooing him because he's not bright which came out you know it's like click they asked him he's like i, I think it was on cross or say okay well look he's you know like i think click said he, he's not a, a necessarily a bright guy but you know i and i don't know what if he's ever had any kind of like formal diagnosis of being you know disabled mentally disabled but 
Um, I mean, how do we ignore that? Like, like it's it's been since September of 2018 since the memo came out. And, and people just seem to like conveniently ignore the fact that this guy appears very much to have intimate knowledge of things that only somebody that was present at the crime scene would know. <coughs> Short of him being told when he's being interviewed. You know, because remember, this thing plays out that his sisters are the ones who contact law enforcement and are saying, look, my brother's saying some crazy shit. You know, and they're the two that go and take the, the lie detectors. They take the lie detectors, which are obviously not admissible in court, but are a tool that is used by law enforcement to detect whether or not somebody's being evasive or untruthful. And, and both of them passed in that Elvis Fields actually said it. So that in and of itself isn't a big deal. But what is a big deal is if they didn't feed him any information in terms of trying to draw more out from him, which is a tactic sometimes used by law enforcement. You know, they'll say, oh, we know this already. We know that you, we know that you did this and they'll give a, they'll give something out that, you know, but, but typically what they're not doing is giving out information because that's what they're seeking. They're seeking information that only a killer or somebody that was there when the crimes happened would know. So like that, that was to me. If I would have had a way to be able to get a note to Baldwin to ask Click when he was on the stand, do you know when Murphy was interviewing him, did he tell him anything about the crime scene? If the answer to that is no, then in my mind, once I see the evidence at trial, that there appears to be something that was intentionally placed in abby's hair that dude was there i mean does that mean that rick allen if he was involved wasn't there no but it certainly means that elvis fields was there because there's no other explanation because the one thing i know is that elvis fields isn't coming up with this concept out of thin air like he ain't that guy you know I mean, it, to, to me, it's like people just ignoring like that exists is so, so weird. I just, I, I can't, I just can't understand it. Like, I mean, no matter what side of this thing you're on, like, how can you not, it, at the very least, be curious as to why law enforcement saw fit to quit investigating this. When I'm saying law enforcement, I'm talking about United Command or Unified Command. Like why why did they quit investigating this? Like what like what like were they so turned off about the concept of trying to you know realizing that the the reaction of the community would be exactly like it was when the memo came out where people are just scoffing at the concept of odinus oh yeah a bunch of vikings are running around killing people it's crazy like was that like a collective mindset like a hive mindset early on of law enforcement like this is not the way we're going with this thing or is it like the tinfoil hat conspiracy shit that this like that there's some kind of like much bigger thing going on here and there's people in power in law enforcement that are protecting these guys. I mean, there, there has to be an answer. There has to be an answer. If it turns like, cause what, like, just hear me out on this. What if it turns out at trial and believe me at this point, 
Like we know for a fact, clicks testifying, they are moving forward. This alternate, all you know, alternate suspect defense. This is coming out at trial. What happens if it's shown? And forget about like I'm I'm not even talking about like like reasonable doubt or like guilty, not guilty. I'm talking about like where is your head gonna be at as a society to ultimately like determine whether or not law enforcement completely drop the ball if it becomes apparent that when Elvis Fields said this about being at the scene that it it becomes clear that he was being truthful about it like like where does that leave us it leaves me in a very weird place it leaves me in a place like okay well now you've got to show me that there's a connection between rick allen and Brad Holder or Patrick Westfall and Elvis Fields and Johnny Messer. And I don't know if any of those guys are involved, but you know what I do know? Is it three cops saw fit to continue investigating that line of investigation for a long time afterwards? For a long, long time afterwards. Frankly, until Ferency was shot and killed in the line of duty in front of the federal courthouse in 2021. I mean, so three years. It's a long time. All right, so I just felt um, very, very... So, like, and, and Baldwin asks him a question... And and again, remember, the state was continuously objecting, like and making the argument that none of this is relevant to the issue at hand, which like on its face, just like kind of like on its face, I, 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 it's an argument the judge is going to agree with because like without kind of digging deep into this, it's not. But in order to to like kind of buy into Baldwin's argument that you really have to dig into all of this and have an understanding that all of this existed in the world in terms of evidence of other people doing this to get to where we're at, to where there would be a possibility that law enforcement would have saw fit to destroying this evidence because it did not fit with the arrest of Richard Allen. You know, I mean, like that, it's a very roundabout argument, you know, and I knew that it was going to be one that Gull was never going to accept. So, you know, I think for Baldwin, it served a couple of purposes. One, I'm going to force her to hear this by me getting it out as much as I can. And, you know, I mean, he got a lot of it out. He didn't get all of it out, got a lot of it out though. So ultimately, you know, Baldwin asks him, like point blank and click says i think that there's a very strong likelihood there's that these individuals were involved in the murders i mean he flat out says it and so then we then we get into the next interesting area of after alan's arrested all right. And after Alan's arrested, Click was not happy. Like Click was, you know, and it's a thing that I'm saying, like law enforcement does not necessarily play well together and and understand that Ferency, Murphy, and Click were not a part of the unified command. These were kind of like they were doing their own shit. They were out there, they were they were continuing this line of investigation on their own and, and feeling like they put together a really strong case against these guys. And, um, you know, at that point, Click was so upset about it, he used the words, I think he used the word shocked and confused when he found out that Richard Allen was arrested. Like in court, he used the word shocked and confused. Um, and he said what I've been saying about that PCA with Rick Allen. Like I was so, I felt so heard. I felt so vindicated 
that a cop actually said, yeah, that PCA for RA for Richard Allen lacked compelling evidence, especially compared to what he, Ferencine Murphy, had gathered on the others. Like when he testified to that, I was like, wow, man, I agree. <laughs> you know, I really agree. Um, you know, so he, then the testimony shifts to that. And he's talking about, in his opinion, that, um, you know, he, he felt it was incumbent upon him to reach out to an attorney of his, you know, for him. And he sought advice. And, you know, this attorney said, well, you know what we should do? You know, you should probably write a letter to McClelland and let him know what's going on. Like, where your head's at with this. Ask him, you know, why, like, have you ever seen my evidence? Like, did, did the law enforcement, did the unified command give you my evidence? The evidence that we've compiled over the last couple, few years? So he does that. He writes the letter. And he sends it off to McClelland. Um, doesn't hear from McClelland. And this is all the stuff he's testifying to. So um, click in that letter also includes a summary of their investigation. Because he wanted to make sure that McClelland was in fact, because he had no, he had zero, he had zero faith that Unified Command and or the feds had sent this over to McClelland. Like, like he's assuming that because McClelland agreed to file the charges against Allen, that there, it, it's not possible that he saw what he had put together because what he had was stronger than the case that they have against Allen. It's that if you're breaking it down simplistically, that's, that's what he's thinking. Um, so at some point, McClelland never calls him back. He testifies to. And then, of course, our buddy Steve Mullen contacts him and that he wants to set up a meeting with him and Holman at Indiana State Police Post. So he's like, all right, you know, I'll come. Is McClellan going to be there? <laughs> no, McClellan's not coming. It's just us, buddy. We got to talk to you real quick. So, um, but but Mullen tells him that him and Holman want to provide Click with all of the investigative materials that they have into Richard Allen. Or no, that he wants Click to provide those two guys with all of his investigative materials. Okay. Um, and that they're going to take a look at it. Because they're claiming that they didn't see it. Um, but Click does. So he brings them everything he's got. and. When he gets there, you know, they have kind of a meeting and he wanted to be informed by them as to what they have against Allen that made them think that they have a case against him, right? And that doesn't happen. Like, so he, he gets there and he testifies that his opinion after meeting with them is that they weren't interested in what he had. And that this meeting didn't do what he went there for, which was to put his mind at ease that yeah, they got the right guy. Good, good job. Good work. Like, and, and this is like testimony from a cop, not some crackpot, not me, you know, like, Oh, like it's a cop who investigated other angles for years in specific individuals for years. And so <laughs> So when he's walking out and like for the life of me, I kept trying to peek on, um, I kept trying to peek on, uh, like both people who were sitting next to me, both of them, uh, their notes to see if they caught what date this was, because I didn't catch the date he went in for this meeting. Like, I don't have it in my notes. I didn't write it on my, like, for whatever reason. I, I don't know that he they gave it. Like, I don't know if Gambi's got it or not. But, um, like, because this next part that he testified to, like, was crazy to me. So he says, as he's walking out of the meeting at the Indiana State Police Post, 
that he notices that Brad Holder is sitting in the lobby. <laughs> so I, you know, like obviously this takes place after Allen's arrested, right? And and we know that they interviewed Holder again down the road. And it's like, oh, man, you know, like when when was that? It's just it's just a weird thing to happen that they have. It's like, did they call Holder in that day and have him sitting out there to give Click the impression that they they were now looking into this stuff? You know, it had to be that, right? That couldn't have just been happenstance, right? You know, I'm like, wow. So, um, yeah, and I don't, I, like, Gambies, if you did get a date on that, let me know. So, um, so then it kind of like this other testimony comes out that a woman with the initials AC, um, who is the mother of uh, Johnny Messer's kid, reached out to Click and advised him that she had an old uh, cell phone of Johnny Messer's that she thought he'd wanted. And like Click, Ferency, and Murphy referred to this particular cell phone as the 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 quote the goldilocks cell phone all right that's that's the way they called it and at that point clicks like oh man like I, like i really want to get this phone this could have all kinds of shit on it right it's like it's an old phone like maybe there's stuff that we can get with cellubrite that we can extract that he thought that he deleted that's like boom and so, no, no, like I saw somebody in the chat now. Uh, I saw a question. No, Holder was there at the ISP post the day that Click went to go speak with Holman. Holder was there when Click was leaving August 2023. That was what? Huh? They updated you. Somebody. Oh, they did? Okay. All right. Thank you in the chat. Ali said somebody updated it. All right. So, oh, Gambies did it? All right. Good. Thanks, Gambies. Okay. Right. I thought, thought that was it. Okay. So this Goldilocks phone, um, they wanted it because they believed that it would and could have evidence on it. So then Click's excited about it and, you know, the Goldilocks cell phone. I don't know why they gave it that name. Like, why Goldilocks? If anybody in the chat can figure out. Well, Goldilocks is the three bears, right? I'm like, I don't know. There's got to be a reason for it. Um, maybe they consider Holder, like Westfall, and Messer to be the three bears. I don't know. All right. So, click, you know, of course, picks up the phone, calls Holman, and he explains to him the importance of this Goldilocks phone. And then Holman tells Click that he'll make arrangements to go obtain the phone. So a couple weeks go by, and Click calls AC, says, "Hey, you know, I'm just following up. Did they ever? Did Indiana State Police ever come by and get the phone?" And she said, "No. She never heard from them. They never came by." Um. At that point, Click's like, okay, enough is enough. So it, it, he then calls uh, the investigator from Brad and Andy's investigator, says, look, there's this phone from this woman named AC who is Messer's baby mama, and it's Messer's. I think you should go get it, which is exactly what they did. So the defense goes and gets that phone. They currently have it in their possession. And we don't know what's on it. Huh? They do have it. I just said that. Listen. Like, do you want to jump on with me? <laughs> Ellie keeps asking me questions from the other side. She's so sweet. Um, okay, so at that point... Um, during Holder's interview with uh, Indiana State Police on 8.30 of 23, which 
I'm assuming is the same day that Click went in there, but because we haven't heard about them interviewing Holder twice, I don't think. Like I'm talking about post arrest. So during Holder's interview uh, with the Indiana State Police, um, Hennessy argues or uh, Baldwin argues that Brad Holder was not asked any questions about Elvis Fields, Patrick Westfall, or Brad Holder, or about Brad Holder being afraid of Westfall, or doesn't ask him any questions about, you know, because like the, the one thing that I was wanting him to ask, like more that's more directly in line with the motion to dismiss you know, based on the destruction of exculpatory evidence was like, I had written questions down in my little book that I had wanted. I'm like, I don't know if I should try to pass these up. Like, you know, pull the shit that like Allison and I always do. Like if we're cross examining somebody, we write our questions and we slide it over and we're like, all right, here, this is what you need to ask. Um, but I wanted, I wanted to know questions like how long, was the the initial interview on the seventeenth of uh, February with Brad Holder? How long was that interview? You know, because the testimony that that comes out when the state puts their guy on, which is Mullen again, is he testifies that what happened with that DVR is that somebody or something happened that caused a you know, basically a, a, a switch to flip. So the thing was running constantly. But it was six terabytes, which is a shit ton of memory, you know, before. And, and like, I like they never, no one ever asked the question. And at least if they did, I didn't get it in my notes as to like, did that just cause it to override? Like it, it ran through six terabytes of just recording like interview rooms, one, two, and three. And like it went all the way through all that memory. And then what does it do? It just like, they're claiming that it wipes it and then just starts all over again. And like, and like records over everything that was there previously or that it, it like it hits the end when it automatically deletes, like, like the, those questions didn't get asked. So like I'm wanting, but I'm jumping ahead a little bit. So, so basically, that's Click's testimony. He was objected to a lot. There were a couple of offers of proof in there, which is where the judge says, I'm not going to let him testify to that. Because at some point, Gull cut it off. Like, Gull is like, look, you know, I get what you're trying to do here. Because, like, Andy kept saying, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to tie it up. I'm going to, like, I'm going to get there. Just give, like, I'm, I'm getting there. You know, in terms of, like, showing again that this this thing had legs that this was this was a real investigation this is this is a legitimate investigation and that we think that for whatever reasons reasons unknown to us as the defense team we don't know why they abandoned it but they shouldn't have because we think that these guys are the actual culprits and we think that because of this arrest of richard allen that that's why that video got disappeared you know like that that's how we're showing you bad faith because this stuff is too compelling when you hear it for there to be any rational reason as to why that interview with Brad Holder is no longer in existence. I mean, that's, that's Baldwin's argument in a nutshell. And, and so I'm like, I, I wanted Baldwin to ask Mullen so I keep jumping ahead because I want to get to the part. All right, so they put on, so the next witness they're going to call is Brad Holder's ex, Amber. Okay, and she takes the stand and she basically only gets out the fact that she, you know, was married to Brad and she works at, I think she said public storage. I couldn't exactly hear her. Um, and she's worked there for a year and a half. And so she starts getting into her testimony. And at that point, um, and there was very little cross of click by the state, by the way, like it was minutes long, uh, you know, she like, that's where she asked the Vinlander shirt. She asked that Elvis Fields wasn't smart. 
and that um well, let's see brad holder was not asked why he's not uh and that brad holder was uh, again that thing that holder was asked why he's not friends with patrick westfall anymore like that he wasn't asked those things um so when amber gets on and i was excited about amber because like she was another one that was in who had some real direct knowledge about brad holder and what he's up to and what he might be capable of doing and um she talked to law enforcement twice and like as soon as the state asked for baldwin to lay foundation like when when did she talk to law enforcement and and andy didn't have it at his disposal like in terms of being able to look up the date that then caused a sidebar and like they weren't using white noise and the courtroom was quiet and i couldn't really hear any of it because as i said the you know it, it really the acoustics in there are brutal but i i do hear like i see her talking about that andy didn't make that argument what he's about to get into anything about amber in his motion to dismiss and the judge says like i'm done with this allowing you to to argue things that you didn't put in your motion so basically that shuts it down like she's like you're stuck with with your time frame of when you claim things happen you've gone way beyond it at this point and so amber doesn't really get to testify at all and so that was it so we didn't really get to hear anything at that point and then you know he he's allowed to do a little bit of an offer of proof okay and an offer of proof is where he is basically going to give in summary fashion what amber would have testified to and they're allowed to do that it's kind of like a workaround if they're not going to allow your your witness to testify so, what Yeah, no, I know. Um, so ultimately, he gets out the fact that, um, what did you say? Oh, I thought you said you were getting on with me. Okay. Um, I always want you on. At this point, I'm, I'm 2.13, so there's probably no point. Like, I'm wrapping this. I told people I'm not going three hours. So at, at that point, uh, Baldwin... You know, says, look, this is what Amber would have testified to. You would have said that um, she was aware that Holder told her uh, that his entire reasoning of the fallout between Patrick Westfall wasn't this thing with him going to church, like actual church, and that Westfall fall about, like you know, knew about it, but that it was that Patrick Westfall had told brad that he was done with just sacrifice like sacrificing animals like during this sacrifice in the woods near a river that westfall wanted to up up the game from animal sacrifices which can only mean one thing people right um and she would also you know testify that look you know i i was i was also you know into runes and you know i was a practicing norse pagan myself and that you know i know that the sticks that you're talking about were runes based on my own personal experience with them you know so that's basically the offer of proof now i i had like i really want to try to get amber on and um you know, I really want to be able to ask her what she was going to testify to, you know, because that, that's frankly pretty brave of her. You know, I mean, if, if she thinks that Brad had a hand in this or that Patrick Westfall had a hand in this, you know, I, that's pretty scary, you know, I mean so i don't know um so then so that's basically it andy's like 
Andy got frustrated. Like at this point, I think we're we're like at five o'clock. And he's like, you know what? I'm good. I'm done. I'm gonna shut up. It's late. Cause I think he was gonna call two more witnesses. He had multiple people that were there that were, I think we're gonna testify to this, but he I think he was cut short, you know. It's like the the freaking motion for contempt took you know the whole day other than it was like 2 30 when he started this thing you know so he's rushing through it and you know so i, I think he was going to put his investigator matt hoffman on and there was a, another dude i didn't recognize that looked like cop to me i wanted to ask him i was to be like are you murphy <laughs> hey man are you murphy hey tell me things i want to know things you know so like i ended up not asking him i was sitting right behind those guys too but he looked super irritated yeah it, it, like it was like i have to tell you like from observation standpoint um it was really like having click on the stand with those dudes with like holman and mullen and carter <laughs> just sitting in there like while he's on there basically shitting on their investigation was like a was like a priceless moment you know it was just like you could feel you could cut the tension in the air with a knife um all right so then they put mullen on and he he kind of he states that look there was only the one interview uh with brad holder in 2017 and you know the defense was ultimately provided with the narrative of the interview and he testifies that um ultimately you know he's not he, he didn't become aware of the thing had been on like auto record recording non-stop until you know the the i think i put in I think it was the 17th, the 20, uh, 2014 or the, the 14th through the 17th. So that like, which when you think about that, when you think about like the police department that is going to be conducting the interviews in the first three days after a double homicide which we all know how the first early days of an investigation, how important they are, how that can happen. How, like, how do you lose all those? Cause it wasn't just holders. It was everything that was recorded on those days. Allegedly. That's what their story is. Like cases that weren't Delphi, which I don't imagine there were too many. I mean, we're talking about Delphi. Like, I mean, I mean, there were probably some, but they weren't homicides. So, you know, ultimately, you know, I, I don't know how that, that happens. He doesn't really have an answer for it. He kept telling, you know, like, he's like, well, I tried to call the vendor, see if there's any way, you know, to figure out how that setting changed. And they told me that if somebody unplugged it or if there was a power surge, it could have happened. Somebody could have done it manually by mistake. And you know, but he doesn't know. And then he called the vendor to see if they could recover it. And, you know, so that was, that was basically it for the direct, you know, he doesn't have any answers. He's super sorry. It happened. They did their best that they could with creating these summary reports. And, you know, I'm like, like, I wanted to ask Andy, I'm like, man, like I wanted to send him a note or something be like, yo, you gotta ask, like, okay, so how long because the the summary interview of Brad Holder is like six short paragraphs apparently and so I wanted to say you know if I'm Baldwin I'm asking okay well how long was the interview with Brad Holder because that seems like not a lot of information for you know if it was a two-hour interview you know because like Holder's in that day because a shit ton of people were calling in tips on him you know a, a lot of a lot of tips came in on him like did you need to check this dude out so i imagine it was at least 45 minutes to an hour you know and, and then the next thing that you ask him 
is all right well if you thought at that time and were in fact recording this on a dvr is your guy taking notes you know was 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 he taking notes and if he was you know i'm motioning the court to get those notes i want to see it i think that they weren't taking notes because they knew it was all being recorded so and then i'm asking him okay well when was the summary report prepared was this four months down the road and that he was just assuming that he'd be able to go back and watch the interview like they always do when he's preparing his summary report because he's not sitting there taking notes of everything this guy's saying because it's being recorded so what i'm suggesting is that uh, it, you know i would have been arguing look this can't be like if you would have shown that there's no way if you don't have the notes when was this thing prepared how long thereafter he didn't have the video to review how is how, how can we trust what he has in this particular report as being what was actually said you know that that's how i'm proving up that 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 the destruction of that evidence was not cured by the fact that they had a summary report but unfortunately we didn't get there um and, and look i mean like even had i made like a, a sparkling little cross-examination like that like you know like or if i could have gotten andy those questions and like passed him a note like in school like she, she's denying this she's absolutely denying it but you know at the end of the day um what came out in that hearing to me was very thought provoking and i mean it should give everybody pause it, it, like if you're of the my if you're so like sold on richard allen to the extent where you can't acknowledge that this type of evidence is just not something that should have been looked into then i don't know where you're at i i just don't know where you're at um all right so uh by that point baldwin stood on his pleadings he waived argument uh Dean in a waived argument. And I thought it was interesting. I have to say, um, like I was telling Allie last night, I'm like, Deaner handled the tough, like kind of the more important hearing. Because as I said, the thing with Nick in the morning, that thing was bullshit. Like she handled not like I don't know if I should read into that. Like Nick didn't have time to prepare for that because he was spending all his time on some bullshit that didn't matter. Like I've been saying for a week and a half. And so he just said, Hey, I have to deal with this bullshit. I need you to handle this thing for me. Or if she's got more experience and they had her handle that, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out at trial. Like we'll always be able to tell. Like, who's doing what at trial as to who really is the first chair? Nick's going to be first chair in name, but we'll see. We'll see who's handling what. Like, who's taking which witnesses, who's handling certain cross examinations, and they'll divide it up between the attorneys. Yes, it was Abigail Diener. I saw that. Thanks, D. I, I believe that's her first name. Um, and so, you know, Gull left it with that. Uh, she didn't set a date. Um, it was, it was a, it was a fascinating day. At least for me, the last half of it was. You know, the last two and a half hours made up for what I considered to be a miserable morning. That, like, I just didn't. You know, I could see a lot of people in there because you like so much of that crew is like online people. Like, I always see the same people in there in line. The same people. And they're all people that are on YouTube. So like for them, like who don't necessarily care so much about the law and apparently don't care so much, they were all excited to see this bullshit with the, you know, the, the motion, the contempt motion for me, it just didn't matter, you know? So I just wanted to get to the nuts and the bolts and the things that matter in this case. 
So for, yeah, the first, first, whatever, five hours I could have done without the last couple I found to be, um, interesting, very, very interesting. And so she, yeah, she took that under advisement. She didn't rule from the bench, which I thought she would actually, I thought she'd say, yeah, no nah, motion denied. So, um, she said that she'd, you know, come down with a decision on it. And ultimately, uh, I think that she will deny it. I feel feel super super uh convinced of that i think i'm, I'm thinking i'm going to be dead balls on on that one and she did not set a future date okay so there is no i mean obviously we have the trial date but there's going to be motion days you know you guys have to know this trial comes closer and you guys know and there's stuff out there like so like she went through some filings we had a bunch of filings i'm, I'm going to obviously have to do another live this week um because there's been multiple filings one came down by the defense today and i don't know if you guys heard me last night if you weren't on last night there was it appears that goal has denied the defense any funds for experts at all um which to me is stunning like i i cannot wrap my mind around like in what world she thinks she can deny the defense money for experts it's like it's crazy it's like it's like she's not giving him the ability to have a fair uh, fair trial you know it's just it's like it's crazy so um so there's that and i want to go through that um and there's also uh the state has filed a motion for a protective order about these depositions that are coming up so apparently uh the defense is trying to depose uh the two guards the two odin patch wearing guards and uh this gallopoo guy um all of which are employees of the uh, department of corrections obviously they're going to be probing in and trying to figure out just how much these guys were involved with richard allen's confession if at all you know i mean they're that's what they're clearly digging around and it seems strange to me that essentially um mcclellan filed a motion for this protective order uh not like trying to have the judge not allow those depths to take place like in his reasoning behind it is whack it like makes no sense he's like oh i'm worried about them besmirching the department of corrections <laughs> like, you know knowing goal she she probably so like look for those i'll probably like i'm doing a uh a gacy with bill dorsch tomorrow night so i hope you all join in like, yeah, like I get 14, 15, 16, 2000 last night for Delphi, but no one gives a shit about us potentially finding more Gacy victims that have never been discovered. It's weird. Get your priorities straight, people. It's like, that's, that's important. Like Bill Dorsch is great. And that's a real passion project for me too. I, I hope that y'all will come and join us. All right. So I got a lot of stuff I got to go through here. So hopefully that was enough. Um, you know, it, it's, it's tough sitting in there taking notes, you know, for me, it's like, I got a shit ton of them, you know, but it's like when you, you have to pick and choose cause it's people talking and I'm not necessarily a super fast writer, you know? So it's like, cause I, I heard like Teresa reading like some of the objections, <laughs> but the objections were all, you know, your typical shit. It was typically hearsay and relevance. That I can tell you there weren't, there were no, no super interesting. Uh, all right. So let me, let me go through a uh, general law question for $20 hollow. Wow. Oh, am I boring you? Okay. Um, thank you for that. General law question. Why doesn't law enforcement have to give the evidence to the prosecutor and defense? Why the extra step? And what is the check on judge's goals power? Uh, the judge's power. Thank you for being on the grind. So first of all, there's not really a, a check on Gull's power. I mean, we saw the one check, you know, which was the Supreme Court. Like you have to either file an interlocutory appeal or get a writ of mandamus to try to like undo what she's done, you know, which they did with Baldwin and Rosie. Um, in terms of why doesn't law enforcement, because that's just how it's never been done. I think that would be amazing. I think... I think that that would avoid Brady violations like immediate, like, like if law enforcement had to give the, but 
then we still know like instead of us not trusting the prosecutors that they're giving us all the evidence then it's just us trusting not trusting law enforcement that they're not giving it to us either way it doesn't alleviate the issue that you know law enforcement gives it to the prosecutor and then the prosecutor decides what they're going to give to us so it's like if it's law enforcement I, i'm just assuming that they're the ones withholding shit you know i mean so it doesn't it doesn't solve the problem really um so i hope that answers your question it's it's always been one of those things that's bugged me too so i i appreciate the question it was a good one and thank you for your generosity by the way uh just shelby ten dollar how thank you thanks for the update you're much appreciated is there a, a money to raise experts um not go fund me family hugs oh family hugs appreciate that yeah you know what like i like i don't know shelby if if you were one like i saw some people in the chat when i was reviewing it last night that were asking that um about you know is there some way we could put money together to to hire experts for this thing and i know you can't use any of these um uh crowdfunding apps to, to like to raise money for defendants in criminal cases it, i don't know if that just pertains to hiring lawyers or if it goes so far as to like money to try to help get the only thing that i could think that we could do is maybe do something on behalf of kathy allen you know and just say it it you know that it's it's for not for a defense fund but you know just so um you know she can live <laughs> I don't like I don't know a workaround around it, you know, to be honest with you. Like it's it's a it's a tough thing. And I like I think it's kind of bullshit that you can't crowdfund it on one of these apps anyway. So I don't know. Thank you so much for your generosity. That ten dollar house is muchly appreciated. Hater guy. If the guards are owed nights, why can't the cops be too? Uh they don't want their sect uh per se to be outed. I mean, I hear you, man. I, I like at this point. People sitting there poo-pooing Odinism in Indiana are full of shit. <laughs> it's like, I mean, how much shit do you have to see, like online on Facebook, to like, like you give like you, all credibility that anybody might have in my eyes when they turn around and poo-poo the fact that there's a shit ton of Odinists in Indiana, like it's there. They don't hide it. They say it. Now, whether they're not, whether they're fringe dudes or like I said, just a bunch of dudes that think that fucking Vikings are awesome. I don't know, but I can tell you there's a tattoo parlor in Delphi called Odin's Den. <laughs> I I don't know what to tell you. Like, you know, y'all can believe whatever you want to believe, but, you know, I'm not on board with you. It's clearly Odinists. Whether they're marauding, murdering Vikings, I don't know. But, um, I know that there's some people that I'm not necessarily fans of in terms of them being racist that, uh, you know, like I wouldn't put it past them. I don't know. Um, Missy Mayhem. Oh, wow. Oh, gee, my girl. Love you, Bob. Did Gull ever acknowledge you at all? No, of course not. Like that was all bullshit. Like I was saying that like tongue in cheek. And, and you know what else she didn't acknowledge? Any of those letters. <laughs> I told you. She's not like, like, what did they think that this she was going to do? Come out on the bench and pull out these letters and read them. That's not how court works. If only these guys would listen to me, maybe watch my content. Don't worry about the, you disagree with me about Richard Allen. Learn something about the process. I'll tell you, I'll guide you. I promise your letters are never going to get written. I hope you keep writing them because it makes me laugh inside that. I know that they're never going to get addressed. We just don't write judges letters, writing them ex parte. You're not a party. You realize that ex parte relates to the parties in the action. And the parties include the attorneys. <laughs> Random dudes from YouTube do not constitute parties. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to disappoint, but it's a true story. Uh, thank you for being a member, Missy, and thank you for being a mod. I appreciate you. You know that. Um, D five dollar hollow. Thanks for not whack-a-mole me, y'all. Good. I don't know. Was there talk about whack-a-mole and D in the chat? Was everybody behaved tonight, mods? I didn't get I don't get to read that stuff. I hope so. I hope, hope everybody was being good and good to each other. 
we could disagree on shit except for the fact we can't disagree that that elvis field shit is crazy <laughs> if you're if you're just of the mindset that that can be ignored i don't know man we got nothing to talk about in front of, like in terms of delphi then like we're just on different sides of that that's that's crazy shit chelsea member for three months oh family hug uh defense investigated this more there, there's no question about that well i mean other than click Ferency and murphy those guys investigated heavily very very heavily but in terms of the unified command 100 percent allegedly innocent love that i love that love that love that i think I think allegedly innocent, correct me if I'm incorrect, but I think, I think Teresa was talking about, you've got a channel. If that is true, uh, I got to check out your content. And if that's true, thank you very, very much. Even if it's not true, thank you for becoming a member of Defense Hours. Uh, family hug, welcome. And if you do have a channel, I'm going to go check it out big time. Um, oh man, the OG huge giver, Nav the EO. I don't even now I don't even know how much that costs like to buy 50 gift memberships. It's so generous, man. Thank you. And I always just assume you're a man, which is completely ignorant of me. I don't know. It's like, you could be a, just a wonderful woman, whatever you are person. Thank you. You're incredibly. The one thing I know about you is you're incredibly generous and I'm extremely grateful to you for your continued generosity every live. And as I'm sure everybody that was gifted memberships is as well. So thank you for your, consistent and wonderful support it means everything to me thank you thank you thank you um between law and laughs i remember you you gave last time five dollar hollow appreciate you thank you so much thanks for being here champagne poppy mic check one two one two yo yo turn the right mic on dipshit <laughs> yeah sorry about that <sighs> someday i'll learn maybe maybe not someday maybe Maybe I'll have somebody that actually handles the shit for me, like a like a person. Like, all right, Bob, make sure your mic's on. Mic check. All that shit. Like Darren's my guy for my pod, but my, you know, for my the YouTubes, man, we're solo. Thank God for my boy Jay. Gives me all the tips. Uh, and thank you for modern champagne poppy too. I adore you. Thank you. Cami Q, another one of my beautiful mods, beautiful humans, and always give her gifted five. Defense Diary podcast memberships. Aw, that's that's family hugs for both you and Champagne and for the five people that just got gifted. So appreciate that. Uh, Persephone, I saw you had to jet. Thank you. I'm sorry. I didn't read this before you left. Um, oh, I hope you come back on replay. So thank you for that $20 haul. I appreciate it. Bob, is there a legal way we can start to go fund me for the defense experts? I don't know. Like, not that I've seen. I like, I, I'm, like I've looked into it and I, I cannot find a way. If somebody knows a way out there, I'd love to hear it, you know, because the dude deserves experts. I mean, we does like the family, we need a fair trial. Like I don't see how she's going to deny them experts. It's like, it's going to get this thing. If he gets convicted, it's going to be, they're going to, they're going to send it back because she denied him money to get experts on things that clearly need experts they're going to need a ballistics guy they're going to and when i say guy it's there's no gender to it like they're going to need a you know, like a ballistics person or a tool you know a tool marking person they're going to need a forensic psychologist if they're going to be saying that something was going on with them mentally with the with the confessions or they need experts you got to have them if the state's using them they have to be able to rebut them so thank you for that $20 hollow, uh, Persephone. Um, Gwen. Gwen Schaefer. So I, I want to say it, it's, it reads like Schaffer. So I don't know if it's Schaffer or Schaefer. I'm going to give both. But either way, thank you so much for your generosity. Aw, five family hugs for all the new members. I'm sure they're very thankful. B. Kramer. Bob, how do you feel about this motion? Which one? Which motion, B. Kramer? Like the motion dismiss? Mm, see, I wish I would have seen that earlier. If you see that, I think she's going to deny it. But I still loved it. I lo like I said, I, I loved, I loved that I got to hear Click. You know, say what he wanted to say. 
you know, because it's like I, I was hearing on other podcasts and, you know, people reading half his letter on one show and then, on you know, the, the second half on the other show trying to say that, you know, he was poo-pooing the defense and they thought that it was a huge overreach. I didn't get that feeling yesterday. <laughs> I don't get the feeling that he felt that the defense was out of out of line at all. Quite the opposite. So from that perspective, that for me was worth the price of admission yesterday. Um, crime night, $20 holla. Uh, wish I could do more for justice. I believe in the U.S. Constitution wholeheartedly. Thanks, forefathers. Here, here. I'm with you on that. You know that crime night. I, I love me some U.S. Constitution. Appreciate that generosity, my man. Uh, Amy K., so glad I caught it live. Appreciate you all. I appreciate you being a member for four months. That's what I appreciate. Aw, family hug. Oh, Shiraz, I saw you all over the place giving out gifts all day. You are a gift giver. I saw you over at T at Criminalities giving out memberships. You are a wonderful human being. I'm sure T tells you that as well, but I'm going to double that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double up on that sentiment because you are definitely wonderful. Aw, family hugs 10 times. Stephanie, $2 holla. Hit that like, everyone. Yes, yes. Hit the like. Sub. We love when you guys sub. Makes us happy because we build the fam. We build a community here. Uh, Jen, DeMorte, $10. Hello. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. It's a new name. I haven't seen you. Oh, Dr. Vonda, you are amazing. For the future, I beg Core TV to hire stenographers who know, who know shorthand to take notes and create transcript, rotating at breaks. I've done it in the past, even won awards, but I'm rusty. Dr. Vonda, I have half a mind to bring you with me in the next hearing and just have you shorthand the hell out of this shit for me. <laughs> that would be amazing. Thank you for that generosity. I was like, I was like, man, it's too bad schools like back when I was growing up were super sexist and you know, girls, oh well, you're all gonna be secretaries, so we're gonna teach you all shorthand because we're a bunch of old white men and you guys should just be secretaries and we're not gonna teach the boys that, you know, like. Thankfully, those days have died, uh, you know, but I, in the meantime, I didn't learn shorthand, which seems super cool. I mean, look at my shit. My shit, you can't even read it. It's like pages of my like worthless scribble, like me furiously taking notes. Oh, I'm trying to take take good notes. <sighs> that was a painful day yesterday. <laughs> super painful. Reminded me back of law school, trying to take notes. Prodigious notes. Uh, smiley Kylie. Thank you, Dr. Ponder Cape. I didn't say that. Uh, I really appreciate you're always, you're an always giver. You're very sweet. Thank you. Smiley Kylie, 999. How can we help the defense team to even the playing field? Go fund me. I see a lot of y'all have the same idea and I'd really like to try to figure it out. Like I'd like to try to figure it out because I see that there's, there's people out in this community that are willing to chip in. I'm going to see if I can figure it out or if any of my amazing people that work with me that are always in here, like the sleuthy gooseys of the world, you know, uh, she's pretty industrious. She might be able to figure something out. I don't know if sleuth's still in here, but she'd be the one who could get it all figured out. Thank you for that $10 holla. Smiley Kylie. Oh, Dr. Vonda. What? Another $10 holla. Um, Let's see. I care about contempt, and here's why. A man died. True. It was procedurally filed in error. It allowed a competing uh, DA, Nick McClellan, to see defense work products. iCloud. I wonder why these points weren't pursued more. That's Those are very, very good points. Very good points. And I, like, I don't know that this hearing did anything about them, though. You know what I'm saying? Like, everything that you're saying is absolutely true as a result of it you know but like nothing was done with it like like especially the work product thing you know when when they're seeing all of the the information which they didn't put any of it on you know so and i think they went so far as to say that the only that they couldn't get into westerman's phone itself and they could only get into his iCloud. But what they saw in the iCloud was a bunch of messages between him and somebody named Andy, <clears throat> which isn't shocking. Like Andy told, like Westerman was a, a like a homie. 
like Allison always used my producer, like Darren, like when we were on Garcia, like that was our like human, like non-lawyer that we would throw case strategy at. They were like, all right, let us, let us throw this at you. And then we'd argue what we'd argue. And we'd, we'd ask Darren, Darren, does that shit fly? And he'd be either like, nah, man, that's the, the craziest shit I ever heard. Or it's a great idea. So yeah, they were not pursued at all, really. Um, and I didn't think that they would, to be honest with you. So, but yeah, your points are well taken. And honestly, um, I put a lot of what happened to Mr. Fordson, rest in peace, and thank you for your service, at Jerry Holman's feet. I, I think he freaked the shit out of that guy. Like when I when I heard what he did with him. You know, like this guy's thinking like the last thing known they said to his wife is, you know, oh, you know, I'll just, I'll just, you know, I'll just come clean and everything's going to be fine. You know, and to like Holman coming in, talking about him going to jail and, you know, cause there was nothing like, I hate to tell y'all there's nothing criminal about getting sent to discovery. Like, like you as a receiver of it, like there's no crime that's been committed, like if only he could have spoken to a lawyer, I would have said, no, nah, man, you got nothing to worry about. Nothing. There's no crime. Like they, they really don't even have conversion against Westerman. Like you'll see, believe like, trust me, like that, that case is going nowhere. It's not what, like they had to try to figure out a statute that they could try to charge him with in order to just get discovery. <laughs> they wanted to dig into his shit. That's why they charged him. I, I promise you. Um, Persephone, new member. I thought you up and been a member. Well, thank you. And maybe you re upped. Maybe you re upped. I think you're gone, but if you rewatch this, thank you so much. And oh, family hug. Veronica. Aw. You know, I adore you. Veronica is really the one who, um, like, brought me into Delphi Docs, so, which I love. Like I don't really, I don't even, I don't even go on my own group on on, on Reddit, uh, but I love spending time in Delphi Docs. A lot of smart people in there. Five dollar holo. So what did you eat last night to help you with your hangriness? Actually, it was very disappointing because I had to wait because, like an idiot, I uh, I didn't know that I was going on Court TV. And as you guys remember, they started calling me, so I went on, did the the uh, Soto stuff, and then I had to be on um, News Nation at like 10 30 east you know eastern standard time so i just ended up ordering something um at the restaurant downstairs which was um, wings brussels sprouts like good brussels sprouts so and then uh caesar salad it was okay i mean it was food in my tummy thank you veronica for your five dollar haul appreciate you always roxanne durkin oh family hug welcome thank you Love having you in the fam. AH, I'm for two months. Oh, family hug two times. Did anyone say Holder and Company was cleared by the FBI? No, no one said that. Like the assumption is, and I'm glad that you mentioned that, because the assumption is that Holder uh, has an alibi. Here's my problem with any talk of an alibi is that there is no time of death established by law enforcement there was no medical examination that established any kind of time of death meaning all we know is that the girls what happened to them happened sometime between three or three and some change and when they're discovered in the morning that's all we know like this whole concept that this had to happen between when the girls got to the bridge and before five o'clock is bullshit that's the state's theory and it holds no water. Like I, like, I, like, I don't know why everyone's assuming that that's the correct timeline, that that's when, that's when this happened. I mean, there were people out there. Like we know that there were from the geofencing. We know if those people are not involved in the crimes, these three geofenced phones that were there between whatever it was, 12 34 59 or whatever it was and 5 29 or whatever that time frame and no one hears shit 
I don't know. I don't know. I don't, really, I don't know. I don't know what, what's going on with the crime scene, but, you know, it appears it took some time. Like, this didn't appear to be something that happened real quickly. So, you know, Brad Brad Holder's thing that he was at work until 5 doesn't mean shit to me because we don't know that that's when the crimes were committed. We had a whole early evening, late night, early morning where this could have happened. So we just don't know. Uh, Lily B, is your mic on? Not my good one. Thank you, Lily B. Appreciate that $2 holla. You were right. Uh, Benjamin Wyckoff, my man, $2 holla. Can we donate for defense counsel to get experts? I'm with you. I mean, let's let's figure it out. Sleuthy, figure it out. Uh, Angie Sherman, $2 holla. Stupid sticker. Thank you. Appreciate you, Angie. Thank you. Amanda the $10 holla. Here, I lurk and learn. Not good in written chat. I disagree. That chat was phenomenal. I love that. Love you all. Power to you. Thank you, Amanda the. And thank you for your generosity. Oh, uh, Caroline Peltier. I like to say it like that because that sounds French. Uh, thank you for becoming a member. Oh, family hug. Appreciate you. Welcome. Benjamin Wyckoff. Wait a second here. Was it? Oh, that was you, Ben. You came twice. Became a member for one month. Welcome, dude. You've been hanging. I appreciate you. Thanks, Bob. Click's testimony is absolutely insane. I agree. And it got no, like a total blackout on that shit. Can somebody in the chat explain to me why there's been a blackout on Click's testimony? Are people just trying to like dismiss it? Like the more people try to shut this down and poo poo it, the more suspect I feel that they are. I really do. You know, it's like, do people want to get to the truth here or are people just like they're so adamant? Like I heard dude had on Patrick what like a known flat out known racist gave a dude that gave that dude a platform last night. I'm like, what? I'm like, how how dug in are you on RA that you're giving a known racist a platform? I mean, man, I don't know about that, man. Like, that's I, I don't know. That's I'm not having that dude on my my show ever tell you that like it, and not, it has nothing to do with guilt or innocence on this thing it's just like i like i'm not I, i'm not giving anybody who has that kind of hate um any kind of platform sorry uh chelsea five dollar holla is there a way we can show support for ball winner rosie they must be exhausted and i hope they know that the people appreciate them and their work for truth i think they know i think they know I have it on good authority that the wives watch my show, watch this stream. So I, I think word gets to them. I think I, I know I know word gets to them. I can say that. Uh, I'm not afraid to say that. I, I know that the Brad and Andy's wives both enjoy Defense Diaries podcast. So they know. They know. They know that there's people out here. They know they got they got support for what they're trying to do. Um so thank you so much for that five dollar hollow. Uh, woman doing impossible things. I love that. It's like one, it, like yours, like next to bushiest beaver is probably uh, one of my favorite monikers. I love that. I'm a, a big supporter of women kicking ass and taking names. Um, thank you for the two dollar hollow. We decide the perm fits. You? What about the coffee shop? Hmm. Interesting. Ah. <laughs> uh. Lily B, give to five fams. Ah, welcome. Family hug. Thanks, Lily B. Super generous. All right. Uh, what do we got here? The KS Griffith, $20. The mod, is, the mod is the only team I trust in the news in this insane case. I cover everything. Like, I'm not covering anything as much as this, but I'll just tell you, KS Griffith, like, whenever I move on from Delphi, which obviously after the trial, I will. I guarantee you everything I try, uh, everything that we'll be covering is going to be just as in depth. So hang with us even after Delphi and check out, check out the podcast. Y'all, if y'all haven't never checked out the podcast, I keep saying it. This dude right here. It's the goods. It's the goods. I promise. Um, 
So thank you. Did I, wait, did I read your thing? Oh, wait. The Mars the only team. Oh, I suggested the Armada. You're the Armada? I think that's great. I think that's the one we go with. Actually, that's my vote. That's my vote for the top one. So if you came up with that, you're a big winner. Like, I wish I was... Like, I owe somebody a sticker. Like, if you're in here, tell me. Because I know I asked you to send your address, and then I got buried. And I really do. I've got the stickers. I want to send them out. I've got a lot of stickers. Um, Isla for me. Oh, welcome to the fam, Isla. Thank you. All right, some people kicked in late. Ariel, pay it to works for legal funds. Oh, Karen Reed uses it. Boom. Urgh. There we go. I love that. What? Oh, you guys are coming through in the class. Crowd justice goes to a trust account setup for the case. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. Ariel and unsolved crimes uncovered Remember for one month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Y'all. All right. I want to, I'm going to look into setting those up. I'm definitely going to do that. Thank you guys for that. See, ask and you get answers. That's phenomenal. Hater guy. Uh, $5 holla. I worked loss prevention 11 years. One terabyte record, 16 cameras, 24 seven for about 30 days. Dude, dude. If you would have, oh man, if I would have known that, how to get your ass called as a witness, brah. That would have been unbelievable. Oh, my God. Wow, dude. You just blew my mind right now, hater guy. Shit. Oh, man. Wow. I'm passing that on. I'm passing that information on. You're sure about that, hater guy? Like, in stone? One terabyte records 16 cameras for 24-7 for 30 days for wiping i think they were only recording three rooms with six terabytes damn dude it just blew my mind man anon anon thank you bob thank you anon anon for being a member for two months oh family hug uh that's a shame written house used gives and go all right you guys are giving me all the answers you guys are giving me all the answers. Thank you for that. That's a shame in that $2 holla. Uh, Don Burke, always give her hugs and kisses. Uh, see, so part of this case is that uh, is this is not our justice system. I want justice for the girls. Here, 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 here. Could not, could not agree more, Don. Thank you for your generosity and that sentiment. That can't be lost on people, and I feel like it's getting lost. Between laugh and love, or laws and laugh, or law between law and laughs. There we go. I finally got it. Bob, we met briefly at court yesterday walking out at lunch. Did you give me a hug? Like, you got to give me a family hug. Like, I, like, I always, like, I will always give family hugs to my people. Next time we see each other, like, be like, yo, I love it. Like, like I met a lot of people yesterday. Like you go, like you know, a lot of people are like, "Oh, well, I love your pod. I love your your, you know, I love your YouTube, all that stuff." So like next time, I'm very, I'm very approachable person. Like I'm not some kind of douchebag, guys. If you see me out there, just come chat with me. I enjoy talking, as you can tell. See, three hours. I said I was going to go three hours, and I'm sitting here at three hours. It's eleven thirty. My God, you poor people. You guys are real champions. You really are. Oh, God, I'm annoying. So brutal. Don Burke, remember for four months. Thank you for giving us schooling. Thank you for listening. Thank you for taking it. Like, I love that you guys like listen and, and digest. It's huge for me. Thank you, Don. Uh, Cindy Lee, remember for two months. Thanks for the nuts and bolts, Bob. Love it. Love giving it to you. Love that you're willing to hear it. You know, some aren't. You guys would be surprised uh aspiring what's up sarah bob can go keep the defense's theory out of trial or is that safe no way i mean she she might try to lock it down some but i think they've got enough offer of proof like i i don't like like she like you can't come in with some bullshit you cannot like you, you like you can't cut like if you you just can't come in with random shit they have enough here they have two cops who can testify as to their investigation with this if gull sits there and hears the elvis field shit 
like especially Elvis Fields. Like, why isn't anybody asking Elvis Fields who he was with? <laughs> like, that's that's like the gap in it, right? Like, there, like that to me, that's the gap. Like, why? Like, wh who are your brothers that you're talking about? Give it up. Who are the dudes? Like, somebody's got to ask that question, right? Did law enforcement ask that? I would assume that law enforcement would ask that, right? Be crazy if they didn't. All right, so I think I'm caught up. Oh, uh, snarky ass angel. Appreciate you. Two dollar holla. And then we got Mama Libra Scales, three dollar holla. Appreciate you both. Last second supas. All right, y'all. Um, like I said, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for hanging. If you like the content, think about joining as a member. If you're like, eh, it's all right. Bob can get on my nerves sometimes. So, like, I'm not quite ready to be a member. At least subscribe. And uh, always like and share. That really helps me spread the show. And I I, uh, I grew the show pretty, like, pretty heavily in the past, like, 24 hours. We went up. Like, I think I'm on the verge. Last I saw, I'm getting very close to breaking what, to me, would be a very, very significant number i think i'm getting close i'm I'm probably like 150 away from 15,000. so that would be a cool number so you know y'all spread the word help a brother out man um all right y'all i've kept you long enough you guys are patient um i hope i brought you what you were looking for i'm sorry if i wasn't as thorough on the, the motion i didn't give a shit about but mm. You know, like I was much more excited about the motion to dismiss. And unfortunately, I think he didn't get to co uh, a couple of witnesses on there. I think he was going to even go deeper into it. But I'll tell you what, if that was a preview of what we're going to see at trial, this is going to be a very interesting trial. And I do. I might have to get Dr. Vonda to sit next to me at trial and do all of the, uh, she's going to have to do all the shorthand. Huh? Somebody just paid you five dollars. What do you mean? Wait, you're already done? On Venmo? No, on this thing. You've got one more thing to do. Oh. Okay. Wait, Ali said there was one more. One more magical thing. Two more. Two more? What? People just keep giving. It's, it's so incredible. All right. Oh, Don Burke. Come in with a ten dollar I I desperately want to care like karen reed is something I would, like here's my problem with karen reed like alan ali and i are traveling and i think that that's starting mid-month i desperately want to carry that trial like i desperately want to carry that trial i was talking about doing daybell with with jay which I, I would like to do provided it could end but that that karen reed thing i'm all about that thank you for that ten dollar haul and thank you for that you know, I definitely, I've, I've said I want to do Karen Reed for sure. Um, $5 holla, please tell the people I see the replies to me and am clueless on how to do this. Huh? So am I. I have no idea how to do that. Do what? Reply to someone's name in it. Oh, I don't, I don't know how to do it either. I don't know how to, like, somebody explained to Amanda the, how you, oh, you do the at. It, oh, you can't do the ad on your phone. You can, you can only, the ad only works when you're on your computer. That I do know. So Amanda, if you're watching on your phone, that's why you're not adding. Like if you do the ad, like it'll highlight it like to the person you're replying to. You can't do it on the phone. Only works on computer. So that much I know. Thank you for that $5 holla. But uh, like if, if you're chatting with people, hopefully they saw that in and of itself. So you're good to go. All right, y'all. You guys are champions. I know you on the East Coast are, it's way late for you, 1235. Thank you for hanging with me so long. You're the best. You're the best. You're the best. Because without you guys, I am just an old man talking about old and new cases. Talk to you later. Mm -hmm.